presence of a quorum, I'm calling to order this meeting of the Regional School Committee at 6.33 p.m. on Tuesday, March 23rd. And we'll start with a roll call attendance. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Penny? Kenny present. Ms. Lord? Lord present. Just in time, Ms. Seeger? Yep, she's got Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Ms. Dancer. Dancer present. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan present. Ms. Seeger. Seeger present. And McDonald present. We are in order. Uh, I'll turn it over to the chair, Union 26. Okay, and seeing the presence of a quorum of the Union 26 School Committee, I'll call this meeting of the Union 26 School Committee to to order and we'll go around and do the same presence. Uh, Ms. Stancer. Stancer present. Mr. Menino. Menino present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Ms. McDonald. McDonald present. Uh, Ms. Hall is not present and Demling is present. And that's Union 26. Thank you. Um, so, uh, tonight we have one agenda item, which is uh, to approve the contract, superintendent contract, um, or consider um, an approval of the contract for uh, Dr. Morris. Um, and just for, uh, for background and context, um, hiring and evaluating our superintendent is one of our number one um, roles as, as a school committee and ensuring sort of longevity and, um, and uh, strength of leadership for our district and for our students um, is, is a number one, one of our number one objectives as a school committee. Um, and one of the things um, we, we did approve a contract, um, a new contract with Dr. Morris um, just about a little over a year, year and a half ago. Um, and the reason why we're looking at it again today is um, we've uh, in, a, in a really tight um, tight superintendent market in in Massachusetts. We know that we have we've had five years with with Dr. Morris, and we've consistently been pleased and 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 as as evidenced in our in our evaluations. Um, and we know that he is a highly sought after and, and recruited heavily recruited um, candidate for the very for many um, opportunities in in the in the state. And so we want to we wanted to express our um, confidence, um, continued confidence in in Dr. Morris, and extend um, that contract um, that uh, contract with him. So uh, a couple things in the contract: the contract is in our packet, and as we've discussed in in our private sessions, but for the public, um, there is no change in compensation um, beyond what was previously agreed in in the contract. The changes um, in the contract are. Um, to do with the the length um, of the contract, and so this uh, this contract will will automatically extend at the end of every year, um, given uh, no prior notice. We've extended the notice for that from ten months to twelve months, or six months to twelve months. Sorry, um, which is more um, in line with uh, typical superintendent contracts, um, and we've uh, tweaked the the voting requirement for removal. Um, uh, to um, a two-thirds vote. So those are the key key changes in this, and I apologize for stumbling through that. Um, Mr. Dimling, as chair of Union 26, is there anything you want to add to that that I may have missed? Um, no, I think I think you you covered all the main points. A um, couple other items uh, uh, changed in the contract is that the severance increases to 12 months, and there's an option for a uh, payout of up to 10 unused uh, vacation days per year. Um, and uh, yeah, other than that, um, I, th I think you framed it correctly and accurately that this is um, no change to the base salary, but this is uh, a strengthening of our, of our commitment of uh, the working relationship between our committees uh, and the superintendent. So we'll um, open up for um, comment or um... Discussion and uh, Dr. Morris, I don't know if you want to say anything before we before the committee speaks, or if you want to sort of hold. I think it'd be fair to wait until after the committee speaks and before. I think if that's okay with, with yeah. you, and Mr. Dunley. Yeah. 
So um, we, we said uh, two weeks ago that we would go around the table. Um, and so mm -hmm. I do see a hand, um, Ms. Stancer. So I'll start. Um, I have, uh, so my name is Margaret Stancer. I've been on the Pelham School Committee for three years. I've been a member of the Regional School Committee for two years. And um, I, one thing I would say about Dr. Morris is that he's been an absolutely steady hand through all of that time. And I think that we just can't give him enough credit for getting us through, especially this past year, but even before that. Um, uh, the second thing I'd like to say is I really appreciate his collaboration, both internally with his administrators in accepting their ideas and also enabling them to act. Um, and also for looking externally, working with um, others in, with colleagues in other school districts and looking for new ideas and, and bringing those ideas back into the district. Um, I, I appreciate his dedication to achieving equity across all of the districts. It's not an easy job. I think improvements have really been, been made thanks to him and also thanks to his staff because he enables them to do the work that they need to do to try to move us forward. And lastly, I would like to say his obvious interest and delight in the students and what they do, um, which is evident so strongly when he tells us stories about things that he's encountered when he's gone out into the schools. And I think that that says a huge amount about why he's a really good superintendent. So thank you, Dr. Morris. I can um, just call out names if, if folks would like to. Um, so I'll just go an, uh, around the, oh, Mr. Menino. Well, my name is Ron Menino. I've been variously a member of the region, the Pelham and Union 26 for the last four and a half years. Uh, during that period, um, my rating of uh, uh, Superintendent Morris uh, is um, excellent. He knows how to plan strategically. He executes tactically. He regularly seeks out feedback from uh, various constituents. He constantly is reminding people through videos and letters and newsletters, and he, he communicates well. Um, I'm impressed. Um, and he, I guess he started out as a, as a grade school teacher, uh, and it shows. Uh, he cares about students. He cares about staff. Uh, he obviously works well with everybody involved. I hope he never leaves the superintendency. That's it. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Lord. Thank you. My name is Hala Heather A. Lord, and I have been on this committee almost a year. It'll be a year, April 22nd. And there's so many things I'd love to lift up about you, Dr. Morris. The thing that's coming up first is how, as a complete newbie, you've taken so much time. Any question I've ever asked, you've answered. If you didn't have the answer right away, and I don't think it's ever happened, but you would go find out and then come back and bring it to me. Um, so as a new school committee member during a pandemic, I absolutely appreciate that labor that you don't have to do. That comes out of your time and um, your generosity. So thank you. I want to echo some of what Ms. Stancer said about your, no, Menino. Oh, darn it. Don't name names. That somebody else said about your commitment to the students, every student. Um, when we were open those weeks, you were in the schools talking to the kids and the parents, and it, you know, your heart was happy, or at least it, it felt like your heart was happy. And um, everything, you just work. People don't, I don't think anybody has how, an idea of how much work, um, love, and um, yeah, time you put into this position above and beyond. So thank you for all of that. Thank you for being able to break it down in ways that I can understand it when I ask you big questions about budgets. Um, yeah, and I'm grateful to be under your leadership. Mr. Harrington. 
Yeah, so I'm. Do we have to do the intros? Is that like a like a thing? I'll, I'll just say I'm Ben, and I wear a lot of hats. <laughs> I am. We'll go with that. But yeah, I, I just. I mean, being completely blunt here, after this last year, right? The desire to continue doing this for an extended period of time, I think it says a lot about who we have at the helm, right? Like. We're weathering the storm. We're in the process of, of, of getting through there. This, I, I, I don't want to speak for you, Dr. Morris, but I imagine this has to be the roughest year for you to be, have been a superintendent through. And I, and I think the fact that like you haven't wavered is, is pro that it says a lot, you know, like people talk about strong leadership. Well, there's strong leadership that's been tested here and, and, that, that still has the ability to smile and still has the, the ability to be happy, you know, on the first day of school at Crocker, you know what I mean? So I, I, I do a lot and, and I don't do half of what you do. And, and I appreciate that. And, and I pre I, the other thing I would say that, that definitely stands out for me is uh, the faith. I, I'm, I'm using that word a lot these days, but the faith that you've had in the staff is, is kind of what has led a lot of the staff to have faith in their ability to keep moving through this too. So I'm very appreciative of that. Mr. Sullivan. All righty. Um, yeah, I just want to thank him for all the hard work that he's done. And I've been on this committee for seven years now. So I actually, along with Shabazz and Trevor Baptiste and a few others appointed appointed you as Mike Morris, the assistant superintendent, and then Mike Morris, the interim superintendent, and Dr. Morris as the superintendent. And I just wanna thank you for all your hard work and carry on, mister. Ms. Seeger. So I've been on this committee since, I don't know, was it June? Um, I've been on the Leverett committee for almost six years now and have done, I think almost every role, you, I've been in every role you can have on that committee and and uh, hadn't been on the region. And, and then having joined the region during one of the most intense times, I think you've, you've all had in a really long time with COVID, um, I just wanna echo what somebody else said, in terms of leadership, like a lot of leaders, I think COVID really showed you who the leaders are. And um, Dr. Morris stands out with that. Uh, he's always been responsive to emails and just in general, I, I find him to be an excellent communicator, um, which is amazing um, given how, how many, I, I imagine that Dr. Morris, you're super, super busy with all the schools and then these then a committee like this and all the other committees that you're a part of um i feel like you know the district really well and the town and your role within the school um the amount of engagement with stakeholders is amazing uh i don't really like the word stakeholders but i mean families and <laughs> i work in tech we have stakeholders um but i just i've i've always appreciated um how fully engaged Dr. Morris is and how committed to what he's doing in this district for this district and for the families. So I, I feel incredibly grateful to have him here um, as a school committee member and as a parent whose who's children are either coming in or will be coming into the region. So thank you. Ms. Spitzer. Thank you. Um, so when I first saw negotiations for Union 26 pop up on our agenda, I had a little panic because I was like, we can't lose Dr. Morris during COVID. I, I was, um, and I think that kind of gut reaction, because, you know, I didn't know what the negotiations were going to look like, was probably felt by others. And I think it speaks to, um, you know, not every leader would you feel that way about. And, you know, and so I think it really says a lot that um, even the the possibility of, of having a transition during this, you know, incredibly difficult year um, was, was, Difficult, but I think even if it if it weren't, um, you know, he, he's proven over the last three years that I've worked with him to be incredibly thoughtful, 
um, incredibly compassionate. And also I think the, the deep roots in our community is something that we're just not likely to find anywhere else. So when I learned that, um, you know, Dr. Morris was looking to make a stronger commitment to the district, I was, I was incredibly pleased because um, during this really long, hard year, um, he's just shown, you know, the ability to dig deep on issues that um, no superintendent ever probably thought they'd have to become experts on in terms of public health, but also not only like digging deep and trying to understand, but also being humble, I think, about where there's learning to be done and, and recognizing when you need to seek, ex, you know, outside an expert um, opinion from others. So I, I really appreciate um, both the leadership and humility that Dr. Morris has shown. So thank you very much and um, I look forward to working with you in the future. Ms. Kenny. Um, so one of the great things about going near the end is like all of my colleagues have already said all of these great things that I can just say, yeah, me too. That's how I feel the same. Um, but I also wanted to just say, um, you know, I have not been on the region for very long and also fairly new to the Pelham School Committee. And, um, you know, Dr. Morris is super easy to talk to. I mean, I've been a parent in the district for a while, and so I love being able to collaborate and feel heard, um, not just as a school committee member, but also as a parent of the district. Um, you know, and and there have been moments where things have not been great, but it's never felt um, like it's a personal issue. It's like, all right, well, here's the thing. Let's figure out, and it's always solution-based. How can we get this, whatever it is, to be good, as good as we can make it for everybody involved? And I super appreciate um, that collaboration and like that kind of leadership, because that is, especially in a time like this where, you know, things feel crazy most of the time, um, to have someone who's like, okay, yep, this isn't working. How can we fix it and make it be better? And to also recognize the times where things are working really well. Um, and, and to lift up those people. Like one of my favorite parts of the superintendent's report are always like, I want to say thanks to this person because they're doing a good job. And I think having a leader that recognizes when people are doing well at something is really, really important. Um, so yeah, I'm really thrilled that we get to continue working together. Mr. Demi. So yeah, uh, plus one to Sarah Bass on, you know, you can just say everything else everybody else said. Um, you know, I, I kind of split the reasons for uh, why I think this is an excellent idea and, and in the best interest of our, our district and, and our students right now to like the hard reasons and the soft reasons. So like, like the hard reasons to me are you know, th there is a pragmatic reality that the, the, the superintendent market, like the labor, the available pool of superintendents in Massachusetts has decreased quite a bit over the last decade. Um, and districts struggle to find um, superintendents that, that will stay for a long time and that have all of the different skill sets, right? Because it's not just, it's not just, you know, we talked about leadership. There's, you know, there's the communications we talked about. There's the understanding of school finance, which in Massachusetts requires its own um, special sauce. Um, there's, you know, the understanding of pedagogy. There's being able to work with the school committee. There's being able to work with staff. Um, and most districts get a leader, and they're they they're they're pretty weak in one or more of those areas. And so they last for a certain amount of time, and then doesn't work out, and and they go on. I feel like Dr. Morris has a very high floor on every single one of the skills that you'd want out of a superintendent. I I don't think he's perfect. I think he he, he definitely still has room for improvement. Um, I uh, he's still still young yet. Um, but but I, I feel like he's excellent in, in, in all of those aspects. Um, you know, another another hard reason is that um, we have, comparatively speaking, a complex set of districts, you know, with of the three different three districts. We have a superintendency union here tonight, uh, the region, um, you know, declining enrollment, a small school. Um, and so that's that's harder than the average district in Massachusetts. Plus, we have an above average demanding community, which, you know, is both good and bad. And, you know, <laughs> if you're here for more than a few years, you love it and hate it at the same time, right? Most, most of that feedback is good and reasonable, but we know some of that feedback is not reasonable and not respectful. And that's part of the aspect. So the fact that 
um, I think I think Mr. Harrington said, you know, if 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 you're able to do this in this kind of community under these conditions for this long, and and you want to re up, <laughs> then then you're an excellent match for for what we need. Um, and you know, just you know, statistically speaking, we are not likely at all to find somebody else who is this good of a match. Um, you know, and then like the the the, the soft reasons. Um, you know, so I've been on the school committee for four years now, um, and and. Thankfully, I, I find myself agreeing with, doc, with Dr. Morris on, on his major decisions more often than not. Uh, but four years is long enough that I've disagreed with him about some of his decisions and told him that and uh, have engaged on that, you know, in, in meeting and, and, and on an individual basis and lived through that. And that's where I think the, the real telling moments on a working relationship. It's not when everything's rosy and going great, right? It's when the pressure is really on and there's a genuine disagreement about where to go. How does that work in a relationship? And I've been so impressed. You know, people brought up collaboration and it, it's one thing just to sit down and have a meeting with somebody, but to continually work on understanding someone's perspective and trying to integrate that always with, you know, um, the other soft skill that, that, that is, is the reason why I, I feel so compelled to make this commit, commitment to Dr. Morris is his heart. Um, you know, we are, this is human services that we're doing here in public schools, and we're not just making widgets. Um, so to have somebody, um, even with all the skills I mentioned, um, who, who doesn't have his heart in it, who isn't, who isn't engaged on, on a human level, uh, you're really going to miss something. And, and, you know, Dr. Morris has such a genuine engagement with being an educator and educational leader and does it with such humility. Um, um, that, that it's, it's, it's just really impressive. So I, I feel, you know, at the end of the day, when we have this many people, right, who, who, uh, who have worked with Dr. Morris this closely over the, this length of time, all e feeling equally strongly about this commitment, it really says something. So I think our community should feel really good that we have an excellent superintendent. And um, I'm very grateful that uh, he'll be continuing on uh, as someone who is such a good match for, for what we need in our community. And I have the benefit of going last, um, so I will um, just say plus one to almost everything, actually everything that everybody has said. So I'm not going to take up more airtime other than one of the things that I've heard of several of, of my colleagues state is the, the time that you are willing, that Dr. Morris is willing to take um, to teach us, to explain, to help us build our learning and understanding and always with an attitude of your own growth mindset of trying to learn from us as well. It's not sort of, okay, you, you newbies on school committee, here's what you need to know. It's, it's really a collaborative, supportive relationship. And I think, um, you know, echoing what several folks have said is, you know, if, if you, you know, the, just the fact that you're willing to and want to extend your time with us um, says so much um, about your willingness to invest your expertise and your leadership in this community. And we are um, fortunate and, and grateful for that. And then myself personally, um, I've, you know, I think I said this when we signed your current contract, but I've learned so much from you and I continue to learn from you every single day. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of talking about disagreement, I actually wrote down on a piece of paper here something that you said in a conversation where, um, uh, you know, we, were, we weren't all seeing eye to eye. And I think the, the word you said was, can I offer a different perspective? And I, I, I take that to heart because I think that's really how so many, in so many ways you approach um, conflict and disagreement, and it's not in a way of sort of winning. It's it's really to find what is the best outcome for our students, for our staff and teachers, and our community. And um, so, I wholeheartedly also support this um, this extension of your contract. And, and so now, after all of that, um, Dr. Morris, do you want to say anything before we move to a vote? I think I think it'd probably be appropriate after the vote as opposed to before, if that's okay. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Union 26. All right, so uh, would anyone from Union 26 like to make a motion to approve the contract for Dr. Morris as presented? So, I'm happy to. 
For a moment, I thought Margaret wanted to. So I, I move um, that Union 26 approved the contract with Dr. Morris um, as presented. Uh, moved by Spitzer. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Spitzer, second by Stancer. Uh, is there any uh, further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll move to a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. McDonald. McDonald, aye. And Demling, aye. Uh, it's unanimous, 5-0 for Union 26. And uh, would somebody like to make a motion for the region? I'll make the motion. Um, I'll move that the Regional School Committee approve the contract with Dr. Mike Morris as presented. Is there a second? Lord, second. Moved by McDonald, second by Lord. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, abstain. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes uh, unanimously eight to zero with one abstention. I did get everybody, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, so in the spirit of learning, I continue to learn as in um, as evidence in this meeting tonight. So <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, maybe if it's okay just to say a couple quick things. Um, um, I'm prepared to talk about a lot of other things tonight. This is one I'm less prepared to talk about and, and probably is less comfortable to me, but maybe I'll mention just four things. So I think the first thing I would say is that, you know, I appreciate all the support. It's really humbling. And I mean that quite literally. Um, when I saw the amount of time this in the agenda, I'm like, cool, they'll just bring it up and they'll vote one way or the other and then we move forward. So, uh, you know, I really appreciate all the words, all the kindness that I heard. And for me, you know, the, the, the having a longer term commitment, I think, um, not just gives me comfort, but it actually is, I think, what's in the best interest of the district. And I can say that truly authentically that that I think during this time, you know, a district should have a leader who can make long-term decisions because I think there's a million ways in which short-term decisions can go awry, uh, particularly as it relates to coming out of um, the kind of year that we've had and the year that everybody's had to different um, experiences. Um, so, you know, I appreciate that. And, and I think that's gonna be really helpful um, for all of us. I think secondly, I think someone mentioned it before and I won't, I won't, uh, name drop who it was, but just the, the word of team. And I think that's a couple of people mentioned that. And that's really critical to me is that um, I'm only as good as my team is, right? And so, you know, when I think of building principals, system principals, directors, system directors, you know, both in the academic side and the operational side, you know, we're only as good as, as we are collaborating. And we're only as good as we are working together. And just want to, you know, take a moment to thank everybody who deals with my uh, obsessive nature on certain things, you know, about, you know, where the bus runs and all that kind of stuff, right? And, and so that's part of my job is to, to make sure that things happen. And when they don't, I take ownership of that. And, and that happens frequently, right? We're not perfect, as someone said, and I'm not perfect for sure. Uh, but I think we really have built a collaborative culture in the district where we are working actively together. Um, so, you know, I think it, it really does matter. And it makes a difference in, in sort of, for me, but I think in a broader sense, it makes a difference for the work that we can do. Uh, that we can actively disagree, we can work together and we can have tough moments and we can continue to work, move forward for the work of kids. Uh, and I would include the entire faculty and staff in that, as well as the school committee, you know, school committees, I should say, um, that, you know, um, to a couple of people mentioned, we haven't always agreed. And I think the fact that we've been able to move forward regardless has been critical. Um, disagreement's not a bad thing. Um, uh, disagreement to the point where we, we don't move forward on something, we're not doing what's right for kids, that's where it gets complicated. And I have not experienced that um, in some time in terms of, you know, how I've experienced the work with the committee. The third thing is, you know, I, I do appreciate the larger committee in terms of the values. You know, it's not that Amherst, Palm, Leverett, and Shoesby always agree on things. I think we have tangible evidence that that's not always the case, but I think 
at its core, it's a commitment. It's it, they are communities that care about kids and have particular um, focus on students who are underserved, either historically or currently, or both, which is often the case, underserved in our four communities. And so that matches where I come from uh, in terms of values, and, and that makes it, for all the challenges that people describe, uh, a community that, that does feel like a match and something that I would want to commit to. Uh, and the last thing, and, and this is going to sound you know, perhaps goofy again, I'm not as well prepared as I, I would have liked to have been for this. Um, but you know, there's never dull moments, right? It's intellectually incredibly stimulating, and that's not to scoff at um, because it, you know, I use the word leaders. I know a lot of people use the word administrators, and that's fine, uh, and both are fair. But you know, you can get lost in administrative items and, and never get to the core pieces. And so, uh, this community, and both, and I mean the larger community, it's even my leadership team. They'll never let me do that, right? There, there's always things to do that have to do directly with kids directly with our students and def directly with how to improve their lives. That, that continues to be a focus despite all the town meetings and town council meetings and all those other things at its core. Uh, it is a really stimulating job, you know, and one might argue, argue overstimulating at certain points, uh, but that's okay. Um, but, you know, I think uh, we are always striving to be better. And I think to, to kind of paraphrase what someone said before, you know, we have always people who are going to hold us accountable to continue to improve. And that's a good thing, right? And, and that's something that really, again, uh, speaks to me in terms of my professional growth um, and our collaborative professional growth. So I appreciate all the confidence that you shared with me and the incredibly kind comments uh, that you, you, you know, shared tonight. And I just continue to look forward and, and continue to improve our district and continue to improve outcome and experiences for all of our students. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, with that, uh, unless there are any further comments, I would entertain a motion to adjourn Union 26. I move to adjourn Union 26. Is there a second? Second. Oh. Uh, moved by Stancer, seconded by, I'm going to give it to Mr. Menino, and we'll do a roll call vote, Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. McDonald. McDonald, aye. Endemling, aye. That's unanimous. Unit 26 is adjourned. Turning it back to Ms. McDonald. Thank you. So continuing on with our regional school committee agenda, um, we don't have any minutes to approve. So we will um, proceed with public comment. Um, and this packet is posted on the website on the regional school uh, committee agendas page and i will share my screen are folks seeing the oh, oh. yes okay
As mentioned, that document is posted um, on the Regional School Committee agenda's webpage. Um, we did receive some comments um, related to Amherst Elementary Schools. So just note for members of the public, if you didn't see your comment in there, um, they, uh, your comment will be included in the next Amherst School Committee meeting. And now uh, our next item is a uh, superintendent's update. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris for that. Sure, uh, a couple things. Um, so on Friday afternoon, we received guidance, actually not from DESE, but from DPH, uh, Department of Public Health, on graduations. Uh, the summary is that for schools our size, indoor graduations are not viable. Uh, they might not be preferable regardless, but they're not viable because of uh, caps on um, number of people can be in indoor space. But outdoor graduations uh, do seem quite viable. Um, so since we got that guidance on Friday afternoon, we've been in touch with a couple of venues, a couple of our higher education partners, uh, trying to explore what sites may be possible uh, for an outdoor graduation. You know, one way or the other, we will have an outdoor graduation for our high school students. Um, you know, our kind of least desirable, but but maybe not uh, scenario would be doing it at the high school, perhaps in the parking lot, the, you know, the fields. We don't want to have a graduation in the fields and then not be able to play sports the season after, which is a likely outcome. So, you know, we're still exploring what's possible, what's out there. Um, thousand seats doesn't do much for aeration. Um, you know, that was the, you know, we have to be cautious about the use of our fields. Um, but, you know, we are hoping to have a venue that may not be at the site of Amherst Regional High School, but is in the local area and provides for a really rich experience. So just want to note that these, you know, I, I talk about learning, right? So last spring I said, you know, these seniors have had just about the hardest experience of ending a high school career um, that could be imagined. And, you know, I think I have to take that back and not to, I don't want to do the comparative piece, but I think this year's senior class having their junior year interrupted and then much of their senior year um, in the same way, uh, we want to make sure they go out with a bang, uh, and but we want to do it in a safe way, and that's why we're looking at different venues and different possibilities. So we've been at work at that since Friday when we received the guidance, um, and we'll get back to folks as we kind of narrow down our choices. Um, you know, it, it's obviously complicated. Not every venue is open to having large groups of people come, uh, and it has to be pretty big if we want to spread people out. Uh, what, what we've seen some other districts do is they have identified some venues, but they're really limiting. They're doing one of two things, if not both. They're either limiting ticketing to a very low number of guests per person uh, because every guest group will have to be, you know, apart from every other guest group and or they're limiting attendance to do two graduations. In other words, one for, for instance, last names A through L and another graduation directly after for last names M through Z to reduce the number of people there. So uh, depending on our venue, we'll look at all of our options and, you know, get together and make the best decision. But, you know, just want to be clear, it's not a drive through graduation that we're planning. It'll be a an outdoor graduation. And again, we just want to get a site that's going to maximize the benefits and minimize uh, some of the challenges of doing that during COVID. But we want to just acknowledge how hard it's been for that senior class. It's been hard for a lot of people, but I think particularly when you think about the last year and a quarter of, of your experience being virtual for many students, that's been a, a real extreme challenge. Uh, there's a hand up before I go on. I think Ms. McDonald's chewing, so I'm just going to call on you, Mr. Demling, if that's okay. <laughs> Man, we gave you an extension. All of a sudden, you're power hungry at the open meeting. Okay. Um, so thank you. Thank you for saying that one way or the other, we will have an outdoor graduation. That is really great to hear. I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of seniors and senior parents will be happy with it. Um, you know, um, yeah, obviously, you know, it's it's challenging with, with distance and parking and you know, all that. And... Um, you know, I've, I've, I've already gotten a bunch of messages about, you know, what about Plumbrook Fields? Can we throw up a bunch of tents there? That's huge. And, you know, once you get into all these things, is I, the logistics is much harder than uh, any of these things seem at the, you know, there is no perfect solution. Just guess what I'm trying to say. But I, I appreciate you and the high school team making every effort to make this as as good of an experience as it can be for the for this class that has has lost so much. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks for saying that. Yeah. And the, the field piece is just, you know, we live in New England. It's tough, right? It, we can't guarantee that it won't rain for five days directly before it. And, and you know, at least for fields that, you know, some of you have been on the committee long enough to remember when the fields were the predominant issue uh, at school committee meetings for a while. And so we have to be really cautious about the fields that we have, the current condition of those fields. 
uh, and some long-term impact. So that's, you know, I think a lot of people say, oh, we just do them in the high school fields. And we thought about that and talked to people who are more knowledgeable that, on fields than us. And they, they express some pretty significant concerns about long-term damage that could be created, uh, not because anything's doing wrong, but just lots of chairs on fields and we can't undo our plans the day before if it rains a lot and it's really swampy and, you know, long-term damage. So that's where, you know, we're, we're struggling, we're not struggling, that's not the right word, we're in its infancy, it'll be a quick, fast path, but trying to find a site that, that doesn't have the dual implications of perhaps long-term damage to, you know, there are non-seniors who would potentially be wanting to use those fields in the, in the fall. Um, so that's where our balance is, but we're working on it. We have a couple leads on out, uh, locations that are outside uh, the auspices of the region, um, but with rental fees that we, you know, are well within our budget. So that's where we are. Um, hopefully in two weeks, I have more of an update for you because there's a lot of work that needs to happen between whenever we settle on our date and all the logistics that go into place. Um, next thing is we had uh, fantastic feedback on um, our professional development day that was last week. And Kimmy Carlos was the keynote speaker. She was um, outstanding. It was like 4.8 out of 5 in terms of the staff responses to her and we are actively thanks to Doreen Cunningham who is reconnected with um, Kimmy to potentially do some you know family and then student outreach events so that you know the professional development that our staff is receiving which is so powerful on uh, diversity equity inclusion could be um, more more folks in our community could have access to that so more soon on that but thanks to Doreen for her work on uh, not just putting together the PD day, but also uh, for extending that out and seeing if we can do some more community events as well. Uh, today, one of the highlights for me, uh, actually definitely the highlight for me, uh, Simon Lutz, who's a high school social studies teacher, uh, I was fortunate enough to be invited to his class this afternoon. And in his class, um, Judy, and I believe it's uh, Batayan is my guess. Uh, I didn't hear that I missed the first five minutes, so I missed her uh, introduction. She is the author of Lights of Day, the Light of Day, the Light of Days, the Untold Stories of Women Resistance Fighters in Hitler's Ghettos. Um, she was a guest speaker in that Holocaust class this afternoon, and I was able to um, stay for about half an hour. Um, it was just if you read the New York Times frequently, there was a piece a couple of days ago previewing her book, which is coming out next month. Um, and I know I'm not an expert, but I know a fair amount of this topic. Um, but you know, the Untold Stories, I think, is an appropriate term about. Uh, the women resistance, you know, the part I heard was about, you know, real stories of women in the Warsaw Ghetto and uh, how integral they were in terms of the resistance. And I learned a tremendous amount. I know the students learned a tremendous amount. And sometimes you have authors that come in and, and sometimes just because you're a good author doesn't mean you're a good speaker, right? And vice versa. Um, she happens to be both. Uh, so it was just a really neat experience. Thanks to Simon uh, for, for the outreach and finding um, this author to come in, but, but, and also inviting me. And I know uh, a couple of the assistant, the, you know, one of the assistant principals, the principal, uh, were also able to come um, just for a piece of history that's underreported, right? It's not that the Holocaust necessarily is underreported or the Warsaw Ghetto, but the female part of that is as someone who learned a lot about it as a kid that was never emphasized. If anything, it was probably looking back de-emphasized and uh, someone who's bringing those stories to light on a national scale to be in front of our students was just fabulous. So at a, on a personal level, um, I appreciated it a tremendous amount, but I know that the same was shared by the students who are there as well. So thanks to Simon and thanks to Judy for coming. Um, uh, I want to thank more thank yous. Um, the town has um, graciously, and I think this was shared by email with the committees, uh, opened a vaccine clinic that is um, tomorrow night is the first round of that, uh, both in Amherst and in Northampton, which is convenient. Some of our staff members live across the river. So since it's an evening clinic, that that's helpful. Um, we were appreciated this just dedicated just to educators in Hampshire County. I know many staff members have signed up. Uh, sort of the interesting thing is we've, we've put it out uh, and I put it out again tonight as a reminder, there's still open slots. So any staff member who's watching this, you know, sorry to ask you to check your email at night, but it's a good one to check. Um, but we put it out yesterday afternoon it also is a sign that I think our educators, and I said this in a different format last week, have done an absolutely astounding job of informal networking around staff members who would like to get vaccines, um, finding, you know, I'm aware that there's Google Sheets out there with that I have not seen, but I'm aware of, of people, you know, working with others, the early birds waking up early, the, the night owls staying up till the appointments at CVS get, you know, get online at midnight or 1230. Um, so the fact that you know, we sent this out yesterday afternoon and there's still open slots, lets me know that 
uh, anecdotally I've heard this, but that many of our staff members who are interested in getting a vaccine have been successful either in getting in the queue or getting their first dose um, uh, for a shot already. So, you know, I want to thank the town, but also thank um, our staff for kind of the informal organizing that has contributed to, to and anecdotally, hundreds of our staff uh, already uh, are one dose in. Um, I know the UMass Clinic has also had appointments and many of our staff members uh, in the last two weeks have been able to access it. So, you know, I feel really good about where we are when we were two or three weeks ago. And I think we were in that, ooh, the state's making it eligible. Are people going to get appointments? And I'm not saying this is perfect and this is not a comment on the state or federal government and how they're approaching vaccine distribution. But I just know locally, um, I think people are, you know, anecdotally sharing much more relief that they've been in the queue or they've received their first shot and have their date for their second one. So it gives me relief that our staff members are uh, feeling more confident about the vaccination opportunities that have been available in the Valley, uh, particularly through CVS, frankly. Um, so that thanks to President Biden, which I should thank him because immediately CVS made it teachers eligible. Massachusetts took a week. Um, and so many people are, are in much better shape with that. But thanks to Emma Dragon and Paul Bachman because they're they dedicated the greatest amount allowed in Massachusetts. So a quarter of what the, the community center in Amherst is getting for the next couple of weeks is going to be available to school staff. Um, so that that's really helping our folks out. I know many people have signed up from our district as well um, for this week for tomorrow night. Uh, staying with the general topic, uh, a couple of weeks ago we had a presentation on pooled testing. Uh, what we've noticed, it's kind of an inverse relationship in some ways with the vaccine. We're noticing a declining number or just declining percentage and number of staff members are wanting to participate in pooled testing. Uh, some of them are voicing that they already are on the vaccination route or they're fully vaccinated at this point. And they don't feel a need to be um, participating in pooled testing. Um, we're now, last week, we were well under half of our staff. It was about a third of our staff were um, participating. And some people even signed up, got there, and said, nah, I don't need this anymore. Uh, they felt much more confident. Um, and so, you know, the nurses made a recommendation to me uh, over the weekend um, to not continue with pool testing because they're seeing uh, the participation rates relatively low. Uh, they also expressed significant concern about the workload with students coming back in the building. This is taking all of one person's uh, time, one of our nurses, and significant parts of everyone else's time, um, and they're not seeing the sort of the benefits um, at the same level. Um, and with students coming back in the building, they, there are a lot of concerns that they'd be able to do their core admission uh, as well as do pool testing. Um, uh, and there was concerns about the cost. So they, read a they made a recommendation to me to maintain our by next now symptomatic testing for any staff member, any student. Uh, who consents to have symptomatic testing on site, um, but to discontinue our um, pool testing project because they're just they're not seeing the level of participation and they're not they don't believe it's sustainable once we have students in the building starting on April 5th uh, to be working with students and doing the pool piece. Um, so that's that's the route we're going for now. Um, you know, I, as I said, there's a number of other districts who are having similar experiences. Um, I talked to one uh, on Friday where they're under 20 percent of participation and from a pooled aspect if you're not getting enough of the pool people in the pool then the pool itself actually doesn't hold a lot of value in terms of the testing um, so it's certainly a conversation we can go back to you know as the further we move along but at the current time um, that was the recommendation of nurses and they wanted to be really or the nurse leader and the folks she's working with other some of the other nurses in the district I think the other thing that they wanted to be really clear about is this is not at all a lowering the commitment to health and safety in the district. It's that they're finding this is actually pulling them away from some of the core mission, especially when the schools where kids are back in person, um, that it's, it's not, it's not, um, it's taking all of their time and they want to be tending to students and staff throughout the school day. So that's sort of where we are. I know there was a present, I think it was two weeks ago, if I'm remembering correctly on pool testing and, uh, two weeks later, with more folks in buildings, um, it's becoming more clear to them that this is not, with declining numbers, declining participation, um, and no decline in terms of uh, their workload and what their professional opinion is. You know, I want to, you know, say that I'm supporting their uh, recommendation to me. Um, I think when we get to the summer and fall and rethink things, we may be in a different place in terms of what the cost structure is. Uh, the time, energy, it's clear that the companies that are doing this are very new at doing this, you know, and it's no criticism, but, you know, they went from paper consents to electronic com 
sense after all the paper consents were already in. And I use that as an example because it's a non-confidential example of the, the, the level of overhead and um, lack of how much time it's taking and how many hoops they're going through. Um, and I think that's also negatively contributing to the staff participation as well. So that's sort of where we are on that. Um, but I know when we presented it two weeks ago, we said we'd come back with an update and um, that's where we are. I have a couple other just very quick ones. Um, uh, Joe Truss, who is worked with our, he's worked with, he, he's a uh, trainer um, as well as a uh, school leader. Um, he does a lot of work on white supremacy culture in schools, um, and he's led a workshop, a set of workshops that a number of our staff, and I know now uh, Ms. McDonald uh, has participated in, maybe others, but Ms. McDonald was there on Saturday, so she, you know, we chatted a little bit about her experience. Um, it's been really well received by our staff, and um, he's going to offer a part two for our district um, on April 22nd and 23rd, so we're going to continue that work because for some people he's done the introductory and then people are, are ready for the next layer of work. So we have 30 slots in that course and, and I know uh, Doreen has reached out with staff and people are filling those out. Three more quick ones. Good news uh, is that our internet speed has doubled in the last week. So thanks to Jerry Champagne, who's been working to uh, on how to increase the bandwidth given the students coming back in, uh, the nature of um, that more people may be on doing meets from the building, you know, in terms of staff members, they may be connecting with kids who are remote. Uh, some students may be accessing, you know, remote classes when they're in school at the secondary level. And so he uh, has worked creatively to increase our bandwidth. Um, so thank you, Jerry, if you're watching, because that is going to make a huge difference for us in our implementation of technology planning. Um, next one is we have our next round, uh, latest round of, um, we just, looked at some spaces we hadn't tested before in terms of airflow. Uh, there was a couple of spaces that we were not planning on using, um, but we wanted to, now that we have more kids coming in, wanted to know what they were, and just tentatively as good results by the end of the week, we'll be able to share those out um, once that we get them formally, but informally. Spaces like the high school cafeteria, you know, tested to the good, um, some spaces at Crocker Farm that we wanted to have, some small group rooms as well as some larger group rooms, uh, tested to the good, uh, above four air changes an hour. Um, the middle cafeteria at Fort River tested at four change an hour because now we're looking at like what spaces can adults eat in. So it's not just the instructional areas that we'd already tested, but we want to think are there large group areas where adults could be in seated six feet or more apart and, and not have to be in their classroom eating lunch or outside. Outside is preferable, but it's going to rain and be windy and be cold some point in the spring. Um, so we're getting more and more of those spaces online, which is great. So thanks to Rupert Roy Clark and his team because they've been working uh, with our folks. And I think that'll be really helpful. So again, none of these are particularly relevant for like core classroom spaces. Those were all done, uh, but some of the auxiliary spaces and particularly the spaces for adults to be in uh, when they're not with their class was, was an emerging need. So we got some good news on that yesterday and, and more information coming out again by the end of the week. And my last one is there's certainly a lot of discussion about six feet, three feet um, with the CDC last Friday changing their um, uh, some of their recommended guidance, also limiting the guidance for dividers, which we thankfully never put a lot of stock in, in terms of those student dividers you might see on TV. And they, they said they really don't make much of a difference and not, not recommended at this point. You know, I think you'll hear this later, uh, you know, at the elementary level, I know it's a regional meeting, but I'll just say it at the elementary level, we, we, we have been able to achieve six feet of separation at the regional level. We are striving for it. You'll hear a little why, a little more why, uh, you'll hear why, a little more late, a little bit later, excuse me, um, as to why we can't sort of be super clear on where we are in terms of six feet um, or less than six feet. And some of that's because at the high school level in particular, um, we, we have a, a good sense now of the yield of how many students are planning to return in person, but it's course specific. It's not like the elementary level or reorganizing the whole system uh, for that. So uh, you'll hear a little more of that, but we are striving. I will say that the majority of districts in Massachusetts are settled on three feet. Uh, our commitment is to be either at six or as close to six as possible. Um, and we're trying really hard to get to six feet everywhere uh, as best we can. You'll hear from the principals a little bit later about that, but I just, the CDC news was obviously a big news story, not just in educational circles, but it was, you know, front headline of many newspapers and, you know, nightly news shows. Um, and we are, we are aiming for there. We are not settling and just saying we're going to do three feet. Um, 
because CDC said uh, we could, we're still aiming for as many feet as possible. And, and I think I think we'll be pretty close to six everywhere is my, my opinion based on the yield we're seeing um, of students at the middle school and high school and summit who want to return in person. So you'll hear more about that later, but I at least wanted to set the stage. I'm glad the high school folks were on the line so they could hear me say that uh, before they get on a little bit. We're running a little behind schedule for those folks, so I apologize. Um, but you know, I didn't want to not mention the CDC piece because it's certainly um, still fresh in people's minds. And that's the end of my update. Are there any uh, questions or comments from the committee? Almost for the superintendent. Ms. Spitzer. Okay. Thank you so much um, for the update. A um, couple questions related to the vaccine. So I, I'm so happy to hear that um, there seems to be enough, um, or at least implied by the data you're looking at, that there's enough vaccine to meet the demand. A question about that demand is like, have we been seeing any hesitancy on the part of teachers in getting vaccinated and going forward? I know we're not. I don't. I don't know. But we. As long as it's under emergency use, there's no p potential to require folks. But I'm wondering, as a district, for two reasons, are we tracking it? One is just knowing that often um, folks have strong um, reaction after the second dose. So it would be helpful to be able to plan and um, be able to absorb you know, a lot of absences after a big group of teachers that gets their vaccine at one big you know, Amherst Bank Center site, and then the two weeks, or sorry, four weeks later, we don't want them all um, out sick without um, being able to have support in place to, to deal with that. So just uh, two questions about kind of how we're communicating with staff about um, vaccines, either in terms of whether or not they're open to getting it, or and also whether or not we're planning for a potential um, sick days shortly after the second dose. Yeah, so I think uh, that's the benefit in some ways of a disorganized, dysregulated system that people have signed up in is that not everybody's on the same day. Um, I think, you know, the downside is of like, I've seen some of the districts, uh, you know, and I know some people are, are getting the shot tomorrow and I, and I applaud that. Like, we want people, I want people who are comfortable getting vaccinated to get vaccinated, right? Um, I think that's a good thing. Um, but because it's not all on the same day, I think it's a lot easier. I do worry about, you know, places where all the staff got vaccinated, they're all getting their shots on the same day. And you're like, what's the day after that look like? Um, you know, I think the reality is most of our staff, uh, there's a regional meeting. So uh, the majority of our staff would have their second shot well before the return sometime in late April. Um, just if you think of the number of weeks, you know, most of our staff, I think, who are interested in getting a shot have gotten a shot. Um, and, you know, so if you if you forward that three or four weeks, we're still on the right side of the return. Um, so I think of the elementary schools, we could, you know, when we're at that meeting, uh, Ms. Spitzer, I think, you know, that might be a little bit more complicated. Um, but I think the good news is that nobody's, there wasn't one date where like half of our staff received a, a vaccination. So I think it will be scattered and we are, uh, the HR staff has been amazing at finding permanent subs who are gonna be with school specific permanent subs who are gonna be there all spring. So they learn the protocols, they're part of the trainings uh, and can jump right in. On the second, uh, the first part of your question about uh, hesitancy, uh, I wanna thank the APA. They've done a really good job of outreach to their members. You know, we sort of made a decision. I don't think they mind me saying it. I apologize if they do. You know, cause they had, a, they had an info sheet that, that would, you know, I saw that was a positive, um, encouraging info sheet about the, the science behind vaccines and these vaccines. Uh, we opted, I opted, it's not them, I opted that they should send it out. I thought if I sent it out, it might feel like slightly coercive because of my role. Um, and, and you're right, at, at, as it's an experimental level, we can't require it at the current time. So I didn't want any staff member feeling like it was implied that they needed to get a vaccine to return to in-person work. Certainly CDC, going back to there, they suggest that you don't need it. Um, so, that, But I, I saw the document because they shared it with me and I think it had strong indication. And I think the first thing I said a while back about the vaccines is that these informal teacher networks have been incredibly helpful, um, right? No one's been telling them to do that, right? Ms. Camera has not, I've not, you know, right? It's Mr. Slovin, none of the principals, but I think that there have been informal ways by which staff members have been able to have accurate information about the vaccines to allow for people to make 
uh, the choice that they think is in their best interest. So I've gotten a couple of specific questions and I've always forwarded them to like public health people like Robin Supernot or Evan Dragon because I know what I am and I know what I'm not. And I think, you know, I've made my decision about, you know, where I think it's a good idea for me to get vaccinated, but I, I you know, I feel like the appropriate role is to have people more closer to the public health who have literally been in vaccine clinics, have seen the reactions, are able to speak more specifically to the science to be able to answer those questions. So I don't think there's been broad scale resistance. I've not heard any reports of that um, from any corner of our organization. Do I think we have 100% of our folks getting vaccinated? I do not, right? I wanna be really clear about that. Like, I, I think that every industry, I mean, not to put you on the spot, Ms. Spitzer, but I, you've said that, uh, you know, in public meetings and you work for a hospital system, right? And uh, I think that's, we're, we're no different than any other system like that. But I think there's a lot of inertia it's that people think vaccination is a good idea uh, in our schools. Um, sorry, Sam, you happen to be on. This is superintendent update. You don't have to jump in, but I know you're at the school level. Would you agree with that that general sense of things? Okay. Yeah. Um, so that, that that's my perspective on it. And, you know, I think the, the big thing, uh, and then I'll, I'll close on another question, is making sure all school staff realize that they can get vaccinated, right? So, so much, even the language on like the CVS website is like K to 12 teachers and then, right? So like, you know, I wanna thank, you know, I've bugged Rupert and frankly, Ben with your other hat on uh, enough with early morning texts and there's appointments at CVS, so, you know, like all that kind of stuff um, because we wanna make sure that our folks in facilities, our paraeducators, our, our, our folks that when you look at who's listed, it's like, it always starts with teachers and then it gets to all the other school roles and so I think, you know, I don't want people, that's not our messaging, but that's the messaging in all the state documents and all the, CV, the CVS website. And we wanna make sure that all of our staff recognize that they're eligible to get vaccinated and they do interact with their colleagues, they do interact with kids, even if it's less directly. Um, so that's really been a lot of the focus of the outreach is making sure that everyone in the organization recognizes. Like tonight, I sent an email right before this meeting started about the clinics tomorrow and I kind of emphasized this isn't just for any group, it's for any staff member in our district. Because um, I think in every organization, there's people who feel more on the inside of things like that and people who feel more on the outside of it. And we want to recognize that there is no inside and outside on this. This is, this is for everyone who works in the school. Mr. Demling, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to comment a little bit on this, you know, the way in which we talk about safety and and social distancing and this this just this whole idea of three feet versus six feet. I'm not asking you to take a, you know, <laughs> a binary position on it, but th but that is kind of my point, which is, you know, I, I think like the, the information we have with COVID and trying to make a, a continuously evolving assessment of risk and safety is that, you know, none of us are expert in every single area. And so it's it's just satisfying to the human mind if we could just boil it down to one thing, right? right. And just just do you have six feet of distance? If you do, then it's safe, which, which, you know, I think anybody here would, I, I think would, would agree is it's, it's not that simple. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I watched a 60 minutes documentary on a, a district in Georgia um, where they were talking about some districts that don't have mask policies and, and that have been open throughout the entire pandemic. And um, I mean, I guess this shouldn't surprise me, but it, it shocks me given that we, we, we just presume Right, the, that we're doing that. So, like, I would feel safer um, with a, a, a strong mask policy at three feet than I would with no masks at six feet, right? And then, and then we get into all the other things that we've done that um, have made our schools safe. You know, all the work over the years from our facilities department that has has kept our systems up to date to where we can now do this testing that we have the ACH um, that's more than four. And and in in addition, now we have most most staff are going to be vaccinated. So it's, and, and, and the CDC talks about this, right? They talk about these layered mitigation strategies and how it's not just, um, you know, that, that this, if you, as long as you do this, this number, that, that everything else is, is perfect. So I just think as, as we kind of evolve and socialize that discussion and we set people up in their confidence level for the fall and for our summer programming, um, I, I, think, I think it's also good to talk about, you know, comparatively speaking, we have very good um, above average, beyond CDC requirement level um, risk mitigation strategies, um, particularly with 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 our our, our air exchange um, and uh, and adherence with with other other safety protocols. So um, you know, I know it's uh, you know we were you know I I, I was you know very gung ho about 
has to be six feet and pushing back hard against the state last summer. And I felt like that was the right thing to do based on the information we had available. But now, you know, with, with inf information evolving research we didn't have at the time, um, I think to, to model being uh, continuously empirical about it and, and updating our, 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 our thinking process is, is important to, um, to have in, in that kind of continual conversation with the public. Yeah, and if I could comment briefly on that, and I don't want to delay it because I know we're already behind schedule. Um, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Demling. I think the, the thing I'd say is that, you know, I don't want to repeat what I said, but I think it is worth it that we're trying to maximize the amount of distance, right? Like, so I think um, no one really knows, right? There, there's some element of like, we're still accumulating information. Uh, and I think the CDC got to a place where they felt like they had enough information, you know, for them to feel comfortable making the recommendation. But I don't think anyone would suggest that, well, because it says three feet, let's not go further if we can, right? That seems like strange to me that we would say, well, we could go three feet, there's no impact, but we could also do four and a half or five or six with the number of students returning and we're just going to choose not to. Like that seems odd to me, right? You know, I think it's, it's given what we know, given the science that we know, given the fact that no one is 100% knowledgeable of everything at this moment, what's the, the series of risk management um, tools that we're going to put in place. So one is masking, which you mentioned, one is ventilation, which you mentioned. Uh, one, you know, which we're not talking about that much, although the high school will talk about it a bit, is, you know, reducing the number of different sections that we're having. So, you know, students aren't going through a day with six different classes throughout their day. So I think what you're going to see, you know, in all of our presentations tonight, although they're brief, is that, you know, we are approaching this in a way to minimize risk. And I think we're trying to take every step we can to minimize that um, to the greatest extent possible. And, and I think that, that's sort of our cornerstone and how we're approaching this and we'll continue to do that. But I, I, think, I think you're right is that there's not, you know, the one formula, you know, is great. I mean, it's interesting. I heard a superintendent the other day say, now nah, we're gonna go four and a half feet, right? Which is sort of like halfway between three and six. And I'm not trying to like belittle anyone or make any negative comments, but I think the idea is can we maximize as much as, as, much as we can while still maintaining our instructional programming uh, the amount of space and all the other mitigation strategies we have. And that's what we're going to plan to do. Great. I'm going to um, try to keep us moving because we're, we're pretty far behind now. So I um, uh, hope folks don't have um, uh, any, any burning questions, but Dr. Morris is always available by, by email as well and phone calls. So as we well know, <laughs> um, for chairs update, I think um, I'll, I'll try to be, I'll be quick. Um, I was just going to mention that, um, which Dr. Morris already did, that I participated um, now for the complete uh, dismantling white supremacy workshop with Joe Tress and his team. Um, it was a phenomenal learning experience. Um, there were about 30 other educators um, from, from ARPS. And I know that um, Ms. Lord participated, I think last summer in, in one as well. And there were about <laughs> She's sometime in the last 12 months, 18 months, um, <laughs> with, with an equally large or, or even larger number of educators. Um, and I think, um, you know, in, in thinking about this, it's, you know, it's a really tremendous learning journey for myself. Um, and I really do look forward to continuing the work as a committee um, together on, on dismantling white supremacy in our schools and partnering collaborating with the with the teachers, educators, APEA, and, and the entire district and, and working on that. Um, one of the, I mentioned this to Dr. Morris, one of the eye-opening things I think that myself and, and several of the other educators came away with because it's, we're, we participate in this with educators from all over the country. Um, I think there was about 170 people in total. Um, and one of the things was listening in the small breakouts to what are the challenges that other districts are facing? Um, and in many, in many, many cases, the challenges that they're facing in, 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 this, in this journey um, are, are akin to sort of where we might have been five or 10 years ago. Um, so it, it's heartening to see. It doesn't diminish the amount of work that's ahead of us, but I, I think it's, it's also heartening to see and acknowledge um, the tremendous accomplishments and, and sort of progress that we've made as a district and a community um, over the years. So lots, lots to do, um, but we've, we've, we're on the right track. Um, and I'm going to now turn it over to uh, our next item, school committee announcements. Um, 
Are there any announcements from committee members? Ms. Lord. Thank you, Chair McDonald. I wanna take this moment to um, say that I condemn the horrific and hateful targeting and murdering of Asian women last week. Not only that, but um, according to stopaapihate.org, from March 19th of 2020 to February 28th, um, there were 3,795 incidents of reported harassment, bullying, and targeting of our Asian community. And um, we know, I know that for every one report, there's a ton that aren't reported. So um, Chair McDonald and I have drafted a statement in support of our Asian and Asian American community and families. And I'm hoping that we can vote on that at our next regional school committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Demling. Yeah, um, so, so thank you for, for bringing that forward, Ms. Lord, Ms. McDonald. So if, if there's urgency to, to, to passing something like this, the open meeting law doesn't prevent us from taking new business up as long as it's not controversial uh, or we don't, we don't have any reasonable expectation that, that the public is going to see it as controversial. Um, and I mean, so, I, so it's really, it's really the, up to the chair to decide. Um, you know, personally, I don't see any reason why we would expect this to be controversial in terms of, you know, committee support for it. Um, and it would, it would be, it would be really good to, I mean, I just think to, to hear, hear that, um, given the, given, given, just given the seriousness and the urgency of the situation. Yeah. Thank, um, thanks for bringing that up. If, um, I'll, I'll sort of look around the, the screen to see how others on the committee feel. Um, if it's something that we wanted to take up, uh, tonight, we could add that. I would recommend if we add it to between items C and D. Um, and um, otherwise, we could address it in, in two weeks as our next meeting. So how, how do, what do folks think about adding that to our agenda tonight? Seeing a lot of um, head nods and thumbs up. Okay, so um, in the interest of all of our guests that are attending this, this meeting, if it's okay with you, Ms. Lord, we'll put that um, after item C before we get to item D. Okay, thank you. Any other announcements? No? Okay, so we'll move on to our new and continuing business. And first up is our FY22 budget vote. Um, and there, uh, as, as we tee this up, um, before I hand it over, hand the reins over to you, just to clarify, um, there was a, a significant amount of material that was posted online today um, on the budget um, on the budget portion of the ARPS uh, website. So the folder and the complete budget document is now available there. Um, the what's in the packet tonight are sort of are the the summary documents that will that summarize the changes and the, and the key items that we'll be voting on. But for um, viewing public that would like to view all of the details of the budget, it is available online. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris and Dr. Yeah. And Dr. Slack. Yeah, we're going to be relatively brief tonight. Um, at a core level, there's not a lot of changes since the last time you looked at this uh, in terms of the edge cuts, which is where many people go. And that's not the only part of the budget, but I think it is the part that attracts the most attention uh, in this particular community. Uh, we're, we're, there's no reductions or additions that weren't publicly presented last time. Um, the one thing that is uh, a bit different is we made a decision about a recommendation uh, in terms of an assessment method. Uh, and maybe I'll speak to that a little bit and Dr. Slaughter can certainly add, but uh, essentially what we're recommending to you is to use the 65% method. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why we're recommending that. Uh, and this was in the packet as well with, with more information. We, we kept the uh, information, you know, in terms of the town of Amherst, we met the 2.1% increase guidance that we've now received from the town of Amherst. Um, at the last four town meeting, town of Pelham indicated they would be okay at 45, 55, or 65 um, that they planned for this. And I know at Leverett, they, uh, the uh, Leverett folks, um, not, not you, Bethany, but uh, at, at the four town meeting indicated, you know, some concerns about this. Um, 
but in, in real terms, it's a 0.49 reduction, uh, which is a full, it's essentially 2% below the guidance that we received from the town of Leverett. Town of Leverett gave us guidance of no more than no more than 1.5% increase. So, you know, I think for the folks in Shutesbury, you know, um, they advocated for the 65%. Um, you know, and I think the 65% because all the other numbers went up because Amherst went up. Um, you know, it, it it it's it's sort of interesting how it how it plays out financially, but we feel like this has the best chance of passing the four towns um, at town meeting and the town council. We feel like it does keep within the guidelines, the budget guidelines and in, in real numbers uh, that we receive from all four communities. Um, there is no perfect compromise here. I mean, I think that's really clear um, that there, if we could propose something everyone would be super happy with, uh, we would do it. I don't think that that that's out there. Um, I don't think there's a perfect solution, but if we do think this is kind of the middle ground solution that um, keeps within budget guidelines, you know, particularly for two towns that would prefer us not to be at 65, it does get us to 65 in a town that does. And again, you know, it stays within what we heard from the town of Pelham. So, that's what we're recommending to you tonight. Um, just to back up a step, uh, what what we're asking you to uh, do is whether you agree with it or not, we can adjust it if, if you want Doug to, to look at a different number that has been presented prior, is the votes, for those of you who don't know, is you, you have to vote to amend the regional agreement for one year for this adjusted assessment method. In other words, this is not what's in the regional agreement. So the school committee, if they agree with this, would have to vote on the assessment method that's used, and this is in the packet, the language, thank you, Dr. Slaughter is in the packet. Uh, the raw numbers per town of the assessment also needs to be voted, uh, and then the debt needs to be voted. So it's actually three votes, one on the assessment method, one on the operating budget, and one on the capital budget that needs to be voted. Again, at a core level, there hasn't been any changes to um, ads cuts. There have been some adjustments based on, you know, Amherst giving a little more, us trying to reduce a little bit, use a little bit less choice to make ourselves more sustainable. Uh, but in terms of the personnel implications, they remain the same from, from two weeks ago. Dr. Slaughter, what did I miss? Uh, nothing really. Um, I'm, I will say on the, I'm noticing on the budget, on the motion language, I don't think I put in the correct dollar amount uh, for the budget. So I will have to give you the correct dollar amount. You know, for the, uh, so I try to, you know, the budget language that we have to vote is actually very, very specific, which I did, therefore copy it from the previous year. And I think I edited the fiscal year, but not the actual uh, budget number. So I will make sure to get that to you when we get to that, that, that step. But, uh, but otherwise, as far as the mechanics of what we're talking about, the, the, the nuts and bolts are the same as what we talked about uh, last time. Doug, I'd recommend before we open up for comments and questions, if you could, uh, when you do get the correct numbers, um, just if you could project them so that, you know, both the committee and then the community could see the the actual numbers that the committee would be voting on. But at this point, we're open up for any questions or comments from any committee members. Yes, uh, Thank you for Dr. Morris for the explanation of why you went with this budget. Um, I just want to say I'm I uh, I'm looking at last time where we had a version A and version B. Um, what I want to express is my disappointment at not going with something on version A, period, because um, for folks listening, that's it's a twenty one thousand dollar difference between what could have been in the district and what we're going to be probably voting on, I mean, what we're going to be voting on tonight is 65% on the version B budget. It, I, I'm just really, really sad that that money is not going to be in the budget um, and that we we couldn't work out, um, not not the administration, I mean, the four towns could not work out a way to have that money be there. Um, and that that's all I want to say. Ms. Lord? This might be the simplest, most obvious question, but we are voting on just the regional, right? Middle and secondary. Because uh, I see uh, some elementary school stuff in there, but you can vote on one section without having the other. Does that make sense, kind of? It, yeah. Um, so, yes, tonight is just the regional budget, just the 7 through 12 um, district budget. I think where, where it gets a little confusing is that. Um, when we're doing assessment methods, actually the minimum contribution 
gets funky here, uh, to use very technical terms, sorry, um, because it, it somewhat bases it on the town, which again then gets split between the elementary and the secondary, and the elementary part of it, what we don't vote on, actually has implications for what the minimum contribution amount is at the region, which then affects the assessments to each member town. So, you know, generally what happens is if the, if the minimum contribution is going up at the region, it's getting more expensive for a town, it's generally the flip is happening at their elementary level um, in terms of how the state calculates it. So there is a connection there, but tonight really all we're talking about is the regional school budget. Yeah, sorry if that wasn't clear. It's regional budgets is uh, cumbersome to say the least. Um, I'll ask a question that um, a community member asked me, um, and I wasn't able to appropriately answer. And, and um, thank you, Dr. Slaughter, for responding to my email this afternoon while I know you were getting ready for um, busy with many other things. But um, I, I'll, I'll ask the question and, and, and ask if, if you can explain it out loud um, in case others are wondering that. But if, if for folks that are connecting the dots and trying to or, or trying to connect the dots across the the various presentation budget presentations that we've had including as Ms. Seeger referenced two weeks ago we had the option a option b as well as the the one that was in our packets even before that so we had three different versions last week and now we have this one <laughs> um, and the question came about sort of that top line so on um, in in our packets tonight it's the thirty three million one hundred and thirteen thousand seven hundred and seventy seven dollars um if that is our level services budget why does why and how does that change um between some of those different versions um if that's our level services budget and i and i i believe i followed your explanation in your in the email response um so um I'm asked, wondering if you could walk us through that Sure. So uh, a couple of things. Part of it is that um, there are a number of funding sources that we apply in the uh, in the operating budget, and so it shows up in that in that operating budget line. So, for example, uh, school choice is one we've classically uh, put in into that operating budget. So when we apply school choice, it reduces our our uh, operating budget requirement. Um, you know, and so it 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 lowers the the total number. Um, we do that with some other things, like we apply circuit breaker and other funding sources of that sort. So when we look in the middle section of of, of uh, uh, most of the charts we have where it talks about the revenue, uh, that's not every revenue source in some respects. Um, and so that's that's one key difference there. It, it, it causes me to think about how we might present it in the future uh, to make it a little more obvious when we make some changes, especially late breaking changes like we had this time uh, relative to school choice. But by virtue of having uh, you know, this additional um, uh, resources available from the town of Amherst, you know, we have to sort of calculate, well, what impact does that have uh, once you sort of run it backward through the, uh, the assessment method? Uh, and then, uh, you know, superintendent and I spoke about, you know, what's a appropriate sort of change to make, uh, whether it be to look at, at our, our cuts list and, and restore something or whether uh, looking at our school choice usage for the year was a was a better plan, and I think for the long term health of the of the uh, balance in our school choice, we we opted to to use school choice. And so as a result, what happens is that line that says operating budget, even though we didn't change anything about actual work people do or those sort of things that are involved in in what people think of as level services, that number did go up because the support from an outside source, meaning not really outside, but the school choice source. Uh, we lowered that support and therefore we have to appropriate more money to to make that happen and so uh, that cascades its way through um, and and shows up in the in the assessment that's required of the of the four communities so I'm hoping that helps kind of paint the picture it, it was a it, it is a you know we could have I mean a different choice that could have been made or, or offered as a suggestion to you was to to restore something from the cuts list um, which would have changed that 1.2 million dollar number um, it would have had the same material effect at the at the sort of bottom of the charts that we have, um, but nonetheless doesn't you know uh, either choice has the same monetary impact. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Demling? 
Yeah, a few. So, you know, one brief comment is I, I think strategically this is the right way to do it. Um, given given our consternation about next year, not this budget we're voting on, but the budget of the year after that. I mean, who knows what exactly we're going to get from the, the, the Biden bailout bill. Um, hopefully it lasts and it lasts a couple fiscal years, uh, but we don't we don't know. And 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 the, the operational budget that we're going to get from the four towns next year is obviously very much a, a concern. So um, I think banking that in terms of, you know, this kind of the school choice fund, school choice, I, I always get concerned the public doesn't really understand what we're talking about here because it took me like two and a half years to understand it after being on school committee. But basically, you know, when 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 students choice in from other towns, we get $5,000 a year from those uh, districts. And so it builds up into this kind of like side fund, which you can then use every year to to help your operational budget. You don't want to get into trouble where you're using too much more than what you're taking in. Otherwise, you end up in a deficit. That's my five second summary of school choice. But basically, I think it's a good idea to to do that. It's hard, obviously, when you're cutting more than a million dollars. Um, but that's that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to smooth out the pain. Um, uh, let's see, I had a second question that I completely forgot about. Um, so I'll just ask my smaller one to Dr. Morris. Um, can you, community member asked about um, the ARMS bilingual therapist. Um, obviously, you know, our committee is very concerned about mental health, emotional health, uh, and supporting all of our students, including our English language learners. Um, I know that cuts are never as simple as they're either enrollment based or um, level services cut. And it's always um, uh, uh, hard to know exactly from a, just seeing on, on paper what the impact to the student experience will be. Uh, and, and are those services being provided elsewhere? So could you just talk about what, what's the impact to students is of, of that particular cut? Yeah, so thank you for the question. So uh, that particular cut is uh, around a psychologist whose sole role is to do evaluations uh, of students who are um, bilingual Spanish English. It wasn't a direct service position. Uh, we had it open. We couldn't get an applicant uh, with the skill sets that we needed, um, with the licensure, frankly, that we needed um, to be, be successful. We'd love to fill that position. We have been filling that position on an ad needed basis with uh, contracted staff members. Um, and at this point, um, you know, we don't have more, you know, it's been posted multiple times and we've, we've not gotten the applicants that we need. Um, so, you know, to fulfill it with uh, contracted staff as needed, uh, will have no negative impact on individual staff members about how we fill the role. Um, ideally, we like to have people on our staff. We think it's a good thing. Um, but when we can't find them, the same services, same, in this case, evaluations need to be completed as part of a student's educational plan. So while there is some financial savings to it, um, the same work's going to get done and it would have no impact on uh, individual student evaluations. The students who are bilingual Spanish English will still receive uh, evaluations that are to, that are done bilingually and the work will still be completed. So um, ideally with this would not be the case separate from finances, but the reality is we can't find the person who can do this world, the work with the skill set we need. We're gonna still get the work done, but there actually is some material savings along with it. Any other questions? And I, I, I think I heard you say that we have to take three separate votes. I feel like I saw four in the packet. Is that, is the fourth a different? Let's see, did I miss one, Dr. Slaughter? Uh, yeah, so we have the- authorization. I didn't scroll down far enough, my mistake. Yeah. It's a special yeah. method, it's budget, it's uh, capital plan and, uh, and assessment uh, and, and uh, bond authorization. So um, okay. so I'm gonna share that now updated uh, slide uh, regarding the motion language, if I can find the right one. And I'm gonna turn to my, um, op my uh, meeting law, uh, it's two thirds majority of, of voters present. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, So I've I've uh, not shown what's uh, what's above, which is the sort of um, Cliff Notes version uh, of of the budget. Uh, but
but I will point out this, actually I'll scroll up and show you one quick thing. So the number we'll vote for budget is actually this number right here, the 31,913,777. So that's the actual in total budget uh, that is being appropriated. In, and uh, But the first order of business is actually the assessment method. And, and I think the easiest way to sort of do the, the, the actual motion is, is instead of the word voted, just put I move to amend and then read the rest of it verbatim uh, from there. Uh, you'll see it, I highlighted in, in yellow here the actual uh, dollar amount on that second motion. Um, Great. And, uh, I'm hoping everyone can see that fairly easily. Okay. okay. Uh, well, then I will, um, I will make a motion. I will move to amend section six of the Amherst Pelham Regional School District Agreement by adding subsection J as follows. For fiscal year 2022 only, the alternative operating budget assessment shall be calculated as 65% of a five-year average of minimum contributions with the re remainder of the assessment allocated to the member towns in accordance with the per pupil method found in section 6E of the Amherst Pelham Regional School District Agreement. The five-year average of minimum contributions will include the five most recent years or take any other action relative thereto. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald and seconded by Demling. Is there any further discussion before we, Mr. Demling? Yeah, I just want to say briefly, you know, from a regional school committee member standpoint, um, you know, I'm I'm voting in support of this uh, this this assessment method, not because I'm making a personal determination or opinion that it's the fairest. Um, I want to acknowledge that that our member towns don't agree on what is fair and that what is fair is fairly complicated given that our region started many decades ago and then education reform came in 93 emergence with the statutory method that had a wealth factor um and yet even with that wealth factor there's different disagreement about whether that wealth factor actually fairly assesses wealth um and so our obligation my obligation as a as a member is to propose something that i think will pass Right, like I have to kind of put aside um, my my town bias about about fairness and say, you know, we we need to come to a consensus about about our town supporting a budget, and so that's why I feel like this is this is the clear choice for that reason, not not because it's it's an assessment of fairness. That that's a question that I did, at least for me, for this particular motion doesn't factor in. Any further discussion? Okay. So we'll uh, take a roll call vote um, of the motion on the table. Mr. Denling. Denling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, nay. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. McDonald, aye. Um, and uh, Mr. Sullivan had to uh, leave for an emergency. Um, the the motion passes. Um, eight, sorry, seven, yay. Uh, one no, and one not present. Moving to the next, would somebody else like to read or would I'm happy to continue reading? If I could add one quick thing. Yes. We do have to read all the towns and their assessment values. So whoever does the reading will have to read the, the numbers associated with each community. Thank you. Ms. Dancer. To read this, I move, this is the budget, correct, that we're doing now? Yes. Um, I move to adopt a budget of $31,913,777 for fiscal year two th 2022 for the Amherst Pelham Regional School District and to assess member towns according to the method in the just approved amendment as follows. Amherst. $16,748,783, Pelham, 
$929,525. Leverett, $1,465,975. And Shootsbury, $1,611,137. Second. Moved by Stancer, seconded by McDonald. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we move to a roll call vote on the motion. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Stancer. Stancer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously 8-0 and one not present. On this one, um, I'm guessing we need to read the, the dollar amounts for each town as well. So um, I will move uh, to assess member towns for debt service on previously approved projects according to the debt schedule for fiscal year 2022 as follows. Amherst, $328,979. Pelham, $26,333. Leverett, $38,594 and Shootsbury, $31,942. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald and second by Seeger. Any further discussion? Seeing none, move to a roll call vote. Mr. Denling. Denling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, I. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, I. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, I. McDonald, I. The motion passes unanimously 8 0 when not present. This one's a lot of reading. <laughs> I'm happy to do that again. I have a large screen. Um, so um, I move that the district hereby appropriates the sum of $500,000 for the purpose of paying costs of the following projects, including the payment of all costs, incidental or related thereto. One, high school exhaust fans in the amount of $90,000. Two, HVAC modifications for Summit Academy and PIP in the amount of $100,000. Three, renovations in the high school girls locker room in the amount of $15,000, four renovations of the walk-in cooler and freezer at the high school in the amount of $25,000, five parking lot lamp replacement and district offices parking lot resurfacing the middle school in the amount of $70,000, six concrete repairs of exterior stairways and decks, decks at the middle school in the amount of $40,000, seven middle school pump room project part two in the amount of $90,000, eight district-wide renewable energy study in the amount of $15,000, nine district-wide ADA improvements in the amount of $10,000, 10 district-wide asbestos abatement and management in the amount of $20,000, and 11 district-wide access control and electrical service upgrades in the amount of 25 electrical service upgrades in the amount of $25,000 said some to be expended at the direction of the Regional School District School Committee. To meet this appropriation, the district treasurer is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to Chapter 71, Section 16D of the General Laws in the District Agreement as amended or pursuant to any other enabling authority. Any premium received upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, less any such premium applied to the payment of the cost of issuance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the General Laws, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount. 
Further voted that within 48 hours from the date on which this vote is adopted, the secretary be and hereby is instructed to notify the board of select and of each of the member towns of this district in writing as to the amount and general purposes of the debt herein authorized as required by chapter 71, section 16 D of the general laws and, the dis and by the district agreement. In addition, the committee shall cause the same information to be published within 10 days after such authorization as a paid notice in a newspaper circulating in the district. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald's, seconded by Demling. Is there any discussion? Mr. Demling. Yeah, I assume when you said further voted, you meant further moved and that you would take that as a friendly amendment? Uh, yes and yes. Thank you. There's no other discussion. We'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, abstain. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. And McDonald, aye. And the motion passes. Um, seven to zero with one abstention and one not present. Is that all of our votes? Yes, yes it is. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And our next item of business is a uh, spring sports. And Ms. Stewart is here with us. And so thank you for Ms. Stewart for coming back for, you know, usually she has three seasons this year. She's got four seasons. So appreciate your uh, patience and working through uh, all those different seasons and all the different modifications to all of our athletics, which have been greatly enjoyed by our students. Um, so I, Ms. Stewart, would you like me to do the slides? Because I have multiple screens where I am. Sure, that's fine. Okay, so I will do that in one second. There we go. So hopefully you can see that, Ms. Stewart, and you can take us away. Okay, so thanks again for having me. This is my fourth time, so um, hopefully four for four. But uh, the, on March 12th, the MI Board of Directors came out with um, a statement in regards to spring sports and all the modifications they did approve of having all spring sports that we usually have. First one up, uh, baseball. It's going to be very similar to softball. Um, masks have to be worn at all times. The little uh, difference between the fall and the spring, we did have like mask break zones on the field, on the playing surface, but this time they're going to be mask breaks off the playing surface. Um, no mask breaks on the playing surface for these outdoor sports. Uh, equipment can be shared, so bats, they just need to be sanitized in between. Um, I guess we just had a town hall today on baseball and softball, but no seeds, gum, or spitting is allowed. I guess they're gonna have to get used to that. Um, and also players, most likely pitchers have to refrain from licking their fingers or anything before pitching the ball off um, to the batter. But basically that's pretty much it, similar to just keeping spacing uh, between timeouts and breaks during the games as well. So Ms. McDonald, there's a number of sports, but I think it'll get lost if we don't give an opportunity if in case there are questions and we're trying to get uh, through our agenda quickly, but I think if six sports later, I don't think people are going to remember about the specific baseball. So if there's any questions on each sport, uh, why don't we pause for a second? If not, we'll just keep on going. Sure. Any questions? Okay. Not seeing any. Okay, so boys lacrosse, it's seen as a high risk sport. Um, we've actually played a few already this year. Um, so it's similar to hockey uh, and uh, right now football because uh, they're both wearing helmets. So they can't wear, I've received some emails from parents um, and players as well. So I might as well say it here. Those shields in front of the helmets, those aren't enough. You need to wear a mask underneath that if you want to have a shield. You can do that as well. Um, calls are going to be made quickly by referees and officials. The quarters are 12 minute quarters, reduce time in, um, of five minutes just so that they can be off the field sooner. The games will get done a lot quicker than normal. 
and that's pretty much it. Yes, and football, similar to football on the sideline, they have to be separated. Right now, football's using cones. Um, I'll also probably spray paint when we actually have our first home game on the field, so like little dots of where they're gonna be standing during breaks. But when they go away, they put cones. So that's boys across. Questions? Girls across, uh, the reason why these two are separate is because girls across is seen as a moderate risk sport, but they have the same exact rules except for 12 and a half minute quarters. Uh, boys across is just seen as high risk because there's more intentional con uh, contact, whereas girls across um, checking is not really allowed. Also, hand sanitizer is going to have to be used more in girls across just because they don't have gloves on. Um, boys across, they wear gloves. So when they get off the field, they should put hand sanitizer on, but going on the field, they won't really be putting hand sanitizer on because they have to put their gloves on. They're not going to be putting glove, uh, hand sanitizer on their gloves. So I forgot to mention that in the previous slide. But girls across, they don't wear gloves. So that's just a thing. Question. Softball, like I said, similar to baseball. Um, you know, I, I forgot to mention also in baseball that the dugouts, they're not going to... Um, be the six feet distance. So we're gonna have to have some student athletes to the side to make sure that all happens. And we'll give, um, I'll make areas available for those players. Again, um, no seeds, gum, all the above that you saw in baseball. There's nothing really new there. Any questions? Tennis is our only, uh, low risk sport that we have this spring. Uh, Massey to be worn at all times. However, they do suggest that athletes do wear headbands, bring towels, hats, wristbands, so they can refrain from touching their face with their hands and wipe off um, their sweat with uh, towels or I guess their headbands catch it. Um, also, only home teams can touch scorecards. There will be hand sanitizers on both sides of the nets as players are switching nets, um, it's switching sides. Any questions? Track and field, we're kind of doing this right now, guys. Like I said, indoor track is outdoors. Um, if you guys have driven by the high school, you'll see them on the outdoor track. However, um, there's a lot less uh, restrictions as you know, Eastern Mass is some of them are running indoors. So we are allowed to use starting blocks. They just have to be sanitized. Um, everything has to be sanitized and um, we can actually use more lanes with it being outdoors. So it's exactly the same thing as what we're following right now. Any questions? Okay. Okay, so ultimate Frisbee is seen as a high risk sport. This is not a MIA sport. Um, however, our coaches um, are part of the Pioneer Valley Ultimate uh, Community, which is a group of coaches in Western Mass. Um, they all came up with some modifications to the sport um, that I reviewed. Um, and it's very similar to the MIA modifications such as masks. They also added in um, a new infraction called space. Um, so players, I don't know if you guys know, but Ultimate doesn't have officials. Um, so players, coaches can call um, space and the person defending the person with the disc has to back up if they're too close to the person holding the disc. Um, so I just wanna let you guys know the Pioneer Valley Ultimate community is kind of like how we're part of the PVIC, our other sports. So that's our league. And we would only be playing um, schools that are following these modifications as well. Um, all of these sports are recommended um, that I just spoke, of, um, spoke about above. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask them. I have one question that's not necessarily sports specific but which um which of these will will also <coughs> excuse me will also be played at the middle school um and will there be varsity and jv for those that are at the high school so varsity and jv that all happen we'll figure out once registration opens maybe today or i mean not tonight i'll say tomorrow or the next day um we'll see how many people sign up and then try out how many kids we get we have gotten less numbers um, due to the pandemic, but maybe because uh, it's the spring season, we'll have more people sign up. As far as middle school goes, we have boys middle school across. We have 
eighth grade girls being able to join the high school so we can try to have a JV girls team for the lacrosse team to keep that team going. Softball, seventh through eighth graders, seventh through 12th, um, but that's the high school team. Tennis, we have ninth through 12th, uh, except for the girls. The girls are we're allowing eight through 12th just for numbers sake. Track and field, that's also middle school. Ultimate also has middle school. Um, and baseball's eight through 12 because of numbers too. If I could just jump in, something I should have said when I was queuing up Ms. Stewart was that um, we are still technically in remote. I know the presentation right after Ms. Stewart will talk about the return to in-person. So this will, uh, we are asking for a school committee vote to move forward. Hence Ms. Stewart's comment about when registration will open is sort of contingent on uh, the vote of the regional school committee tonight. Ms. Dancer. Um, I'm wondering about uh, the uh, fans, observers, will they be allowed for any of the sports this spring? So right now um, for football and outdoor sports, I spoke with uh, Miss Dragon and she's allowing two um, spectators per student athlete. Um, and I'm just tracking that through 70, uh, about 24 hours or 48 hours before the game. I send out a link and families sign up right there and I have their contact information for contact tracing. Um, and I will know who's be, who's gonna be going through the gate at those times. Okay. So that's what we're following right now, which could change. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Spitzer. Thanks, I guess, um, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I know this, Sports are really important to our students. Um, I just wanted to confirm when you're saying these are recommended just for the benefit of the public and for the committee, um, they've been reviewed by the um, Emma Dragon and she's recommending that the that they're um, appropriate for us at this point in time. And I guess the other thing I just wanted to also just reiterate is that um, I'm assuming we're emphasizing, you know, the gameplay actually seems like some of the least um, problematic time in terms of uh, potential for transmission. I'm more concerned about like practicing indoors or, um, or not practicing, but like weightlifting indoors or something in preparation for, for game play and also travel to the um, site of the games. And so I'm assuming that we're following the same protocols that have been in place um, and that you've gone over in the past um, for this season as well. Yes, that's all correct. I think, um, yes, thank you, Lise. Um, your, your presentations are always so thorough and, 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 um, and, and concise at the same time. So it's, it's great, so thank you. Um, and I think we should call out, because this is, it's, this is the fourth sports season that, that you've asked us to vote on. Um, and I think, you know, with the first one, um, you know, there was a lot of unknowns. And I think one of the things that we've, we've learned through the year, and, and um, uh, just want to call out is the great leadership that you're providing, Ms. Stewart. And we hear it, we get, um, you know, individual emails from parents commending your, your work um, with the teams and with the opponents, whether it's holding our, um, our opponents to, to the MIA rules um, and sticking to it, holding our own athletes to the rules. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I heard your voice on the live stream of the hockey games telling kids to pull their masks up. <laughs> um, so I, but I, but I think, you know, that, that really instills a lot of confidence in, in myself, as well as I think the community in, in our ability to safely, you know, have safe sports um, in, um, in this environment. So thank you for all of your work on that um, and for bringing this forward. Mr. Dunling. Yeah, I mean, plus one to like how um, complete and concise your present. You could give a grad level seminar on presenting to the school committee, Victoria. It's really, really good. Um, and and to be so new in this position and to be knocking it out of the park. I mean, this is not an easy year to like be finding your footing on and you know so many positive um, uh, bits of feedback from both students and families about about the job that uh, you've been doing. So thank you very much. Any other questions before we? Move to vote. 
Seeing none, would somebody else like to make a motion or? I would like to make a motion um, that we approve the spring sports as recommended as, okay, yeah. <laughs> Second. Moved by Kenny and seconded by Spitzer. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, um, take a roll call vote. Mr. Dimling. Dimling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Dancer. Dancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimous nine to zero. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks to Ms. Stewart, as, as was noted, uh, for incredible leadership and an incredibly difficult year um, for something that's made a huge difference in the lives of our, our students. So appreciate your support and appreciate Ms. Stewart's leadership on that. And have a good night, Ms. Stewart. Thanks. I'll see you guys maybe next year or next school year, hopefully. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. <laughs> Great. So uh, moving on to our next item, uh, which is the Middle School High School Summit Academy Spring in-person model. And, yeah. um, so I can cue this up um, a little better than I did the um, athletics. And so uh, the short story is, um, Three presentations. We're going to start with the high school, uh, then talk about summit, and then talk about the middle school. And the idea is that we want to share where we are, uh, what's going into the planning, and our thoughts about how to move forward in the best interest of students. Um, and so um, I think at each presentation is a little different in terms of what we're asking for, what flexibilities or, or non flexibilities we're asking for from either the school committee or the Desi. So I'll try to be really explicit on the front end uh, around this. So at the high school, um, and you'll see this through the presentation, um, we had a significant shift. Um, so at the high school level, we were planning based on the school committee to vote to come back and, and uh, kind of, and I think you heard this, more hybrid or, or more limited level in terms of number of days with Desi being really clear that at some point this spring, high schools will be back five days in person. Um, where I was on a DESI conference call today, they said the exact date will be announced in early in April. So I don't have the exact date for you uh, on high school return. If I did, I would share it with you uh, as well as the team. Uh, you know, the, one of the headlines is we, we're, we're committed to doing that. Um, we're committed to doing that um, in early May. All indications are that that's likely the date uh, around early to mid-May when high schools be expected to return five days a week. Um, and it is a pretty significant shift from what was being planned for prior to the DESI piece on high schools. So um, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Principal Sadiq and Assistant Principals Gramaki and, and Camera to be able to talk through some of where they are in planning, what feedback they've received from students, uh, and, and what a schedule would look like. Um, but I think to be clear, you know, the flexibility we're looking for is given the shift of uh, from the original plan, which was coming back in the 26th in a, in a more limited hybrid model to a five day a week model, a little more flexibility is being requested by the high school team and I support that. So I'll turn it over to, I think Principal Sadiq could probably get us started. Would you like me to do the slides just so it's easier for you to manage? Because I'm in the office, so I get yes. a lot of screens. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. Yep, bring that up. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah, you can just go to the next screen. Thanks. Yeah, you just click through. So yes, yeah, so all of those pop up. Thank you. Um, yeah, as Dr. Moore said, we are requesting a start of May 3rd. <clears throat> and on here, you can see some of the reasons why we're requesting that. So if it is approved, one of the things we want to do is to have an orientation day for our ninth, ninth grade students who haven't been in the building for classes yet, as well as students new to the district. We have, uh, so that will happen, it'll be like a half day, so like a nine to noon sort of thing. And they'll get tours through the school. Members of the National Honor Society, and I'm sure we'll get many other students who will be happy to give tours to the ninth graders and new folks to the district <clears throat> to help them you know, be able to see the building before they're expected to go through classes and find their way around. 
you know, there's still a lot, there's quite a few programs still in the building, like all of the, just about all of the classes on the, in the English language hallway, as well, as, well, as well as the world language hallway are being used by intensive needs programs. And so all that furniture has been moved out into different parts of the rooms, classrooms that would have, you know, 24, 25 desks and now, one or, have, now have one or two desks and chairs. In them. So all that furniture needs to be moved back into those rooms. <clears throat> we also have to finish putting signage up in all of the, throughout the school. In the fall, when we're preparing to have phase one, we really only did the first floor because it's where a lot, all the students were going to be. So we still have to do the second and third floor to order a lot of the signs as well. And we really want to allow you know time. Also, all the windows need to be inspected. We've been hearing more and more from some of the more veteran teachers about the issues they've been having with their windows up until this point. And we want to have our students be as safe as possible. So with the air purifiers and hand sanitizers that are already in the classroom, we also want the windows to be in good working order. So that's all going to take time as well. So then after we get all that, the building ready for teachers then to come back in and make their classrooms you know, as welcoming as possible, it's all going to take time. And teachers haven't been in the building for over a year. They've been doing a great job of transitioning from teaching in person to now teaching remotely. Now they're being told they have to come back and teach in person and teach remotely at the same time. It's going to take a little while for them to figure out how to best set up the room to make that happen. I don't want to rush the teachers any more than they've already been rushed and pressured so far. You know, they also need time to acclimate to being back in the building. I want to give them two days of being able to get their classroom set up if possible during the week of the 26th after break they're gonna have asynchronous learning days for students and take the time to really get their classroom set up so that they can do their best job to teach the people in front of them as well as the students who are still going to be remote so that's kind of sums up many of the reasons why i'm hoping that we can start in third yeah, Tom, do you mind if I add a little bit just on the operations side? Uh, I didn't ask the operations folks to come, but uh, I think some of the complexities at the high school level, just because of the size of it, is also a cafeteria. And I know this will come up in the schedule, but I think it's relevant here. Uh, just figuring out food service for that number of students to be in a building, um, how students access lunch uh, is a different challenge than it is at K-8. No disrespect to Dave or Diego, who are on this call, but just the, the, the scope of the, the size of that for our food service staff is, is a little bit different. Um, I think additionally, from the transportation end of things, uh, that is also a significantly different challenge, um, not just because of the four towns of the region, um, but just the nature of the high school and how many students will rely on buses or not. And we're starting to get some information on that. I know from Mr. Roy Clark, who's working very hard on our Amherst and Pelham transportation, as well as our um, students who go to Vogue School. Another factor right now is our Vogue School students have been in person, but they, they get picked up at noon, which adds a bit of a challenge and, um, to our, some of our programming on the transportation end. So there's just a lot of moving pieces at the secondary level. Uh, and I think you'll hear this from Principal Sharon, Principal Slovin as well, um, that, that are a, a little more unique than you know, what we experience at the elementary side. Um, Sorry to jump in there, but I just wanted to do my operations folks justice. Appreciate that. Yep, and I think that just for the committee, there's only, it's, this is not, we intentionally, there's very few slides. So if we're okay to just keep keep going through and then hold on questions till, uh, if, as opposed to the last one, I think, um, I think that would flow better uh, if we could just keep rolling. Thank you. I'll forward the slide unless there's more that anyone on the high school team wanted to say on this one. So this is our schedule. So the schedule in terms of the time classes will meet will remain the same. So we'll still have the 739 will be the teacher's prep time. A period will still go from nine to 1020. We've put in a 10 minute passing period. Again, when we were planning for phase one and now it's just a 10 minute break in between classes. But when we have students in the building, they are gonna get 10 minutes to go from one part of the school to another part of the school. With the signs and adult help we're going to try to cut down on crowds gathering in the hallways as much as we possibly can and lunch we're going to have divided up into two cohorts and the plan now is to arrange the cafeteria in a way that all the tables in will be set up far apart and 
there'll only be at the round tables will be like two students and at the long square tables when they can usually fit at least 12 students there'll be probably four students we we'll want the majority of lunches to be eaten outside or in the classroom and after we get final numbers and start finalizing our plans we'll have designated spaces outside for for students to eat their lunches and we'll let all of them know exactly where they'll be expected to get their lunches and the options they'll have and where they want to eat and you can see after that c block is still 1 to 220 then at 220 we're asking all the students who will be who will be in person to leave the building to go to get on the buses and go home and that 220 to 250 time will be the time that the student, the teachers who are in person will be offering extra help to the students who are remote. The idea that during the classes, students who are in person will have plenty of time to ask clarifying questions, get a little extra help on things. And we wanted to designate some time so teachers will also be able to answer questions for students that are home during the school day. So we spent a little bit of time thinking about questions that you might have. And these are questions that came to us um, primarily from families. And so I imagine you'll have more questions, but we decided we would answer a few of your questions, possible questions in advance. Um, and so the first question I think Mr. Sadiq just answered truly is, will students be eating um, in their classrooms when they're not outside? Um, Again, we're going to encourage outside. We know that outside with masks off is much safer. So that's what we're going to encourage. Um, and if it's nice out, I think it won't be hard. Um, uh, that kind of encouragement won't be hard. Um, if it is raining, you know, most of our answers to this question really depends on the number of students that will be in person. Um, and so they will remain in classrooms and then other settings that we've set aside for eating um, that will really allow for six feet distance um, because their masks will be off. We'll talk more about, you know, how much talking and, you know, this is a complex question. Um, even in class when students are thirsty and drinking, I know that the elementary schools have done a good job encouraging folks to have water bottles with straws. So there's, there's a lot to think about there, but in terms of eating, um, we're, we're looking for at least six feet distance, if not outside. Um, and in terms of the physical distance in in class, I appreciate um, Mr. Demling's points earlier about this, because I, I agree. I think we need to create a culture of um, sort of health and safety and respect for each other, in addition to evaluating the, the sort of science-based research on this. And so we're striving for six feet, right? That's our goal. Um, we will maintain at least three feet, okay? so. Um, but again, that's not, not sort of magical number at this point. It's, it's what we've got, what, what the research is suggesting to us. Um, this year, we do have a D block. And so many folks had questions about when that will meet. Um, so we're going to have, if you think back to that schedule, the schedule, the full lunch block is one hour. Um, and so there'll be cohorts, A and B. And so half of that lunch block will be for D block and half of it will be used for lunch. Um, if you are, if you don't have a D block class, you will be um, in a directed study. Again, we're hoping um, to have as much of that outside as possible. You can go back to that slide, Mr. Morris. Um, so the D block, you know, those D block classes don't necessarily meet every single day um, and they will include some synchronous meetings. Um, but uh, there's a chance there will also be asynchronous work that students will be working on. Um, academic skill students are going to be scheduled um, with their teacher teachers, again, also opposite the lunch period. Um, but that's a little bit more personalized. And so that really depends on the needs of the student and the liaison and, um, again, their needs. So that's the D block. Um, the school building. So uh, the students may end up arriving a little bit sooner um, it's sounding like possibly right around 840, but we're not going to open the doors um, until 850. Again, we'd prefer folks to congregate outside if they need to congregate and <laughs> inside is just indeed less safe. Um, and so we're going to ask them to remain outside until 850 a.m. Um, we're going to have to talk about how to supervise the congregation outside. So that's, that's another um, sort of puzzle that we're working through. We can move to the next slide. Um, so again, I think Mr. Sadiq answered this question. Students are going to be dismissed at 2.20. 
um, and they are going to be expected to leave the building at that time. Um, many students will stay for extracurricular activities and for sports, um, but we are asking students to go outside um, for that. Um, will there be extra help in the building after 2.20? And the answer to this question is no. Um, students are going to be using that time to support students that have remained remote. Um, for students who need extra help when they're in person, they're going to make, hopefully they'll make arrangements and we'll encourage them to make arrangements with teachers for, for extra help within that class period. The good news with the block schedule here is those class periods are longer. And so there's a little bit more opportunity for individual support um, given the length of those classes. Um, for students who remain remote, will there be orientations in the fall to support them with their transition to the high school building? Yes, of course. Absolutely. Um, how many teachers will return to in-person? Right now, it's looking like most, pe most teachers are returning to the building. So that's, that's the good news. Um, how many students will be in person? We've got some preliminary results and it's looking at, at about two thirds of the students have adopted to be in person, while a third of students have uh, adopted to remain remote. Um, this may change as more responses come in, and it may be that Mr. Sadiq has even a more updated number than what we spoke about earlier today. So those are the FAQs we came up with. Um, we, unless Mr. Sadiq or Ms. Gramacki have more to, to add to these FAQs, um, we'd love to take questions. Any additions? I have one, which is I just want to thank because they ran a couple of town halls last week, I want to say, yeah. um, that were really helpful in some of these FAQs because I was more a facilitator than a participant in those, but um, came directly from the town halls. So, you know, just want to thank the team for their work, especially as this was a more significant shift uh, after the DESE piece than probably at any of our other levels uh, from the way we were thinking about it. So, um, we can certainly, uh, with Ms. McDonald's approval, open up for questions from the committee. And Ms. Seeger. Wow, thank you for all the work you've been putting into this, um, all of you. This I can't imagine how complicated this is. Um, and I appreciate all the FAQs. A big question for me, knowing that these, um, we recently voted on late start times for the fall. I see it's happening now, which makes sense logically. How are the buses going to work for regions for, between the districts like Leverett and the region? So I can jump in on that one. Uh, so I had a good conversation with Superintendent Colkeen yesterday about this because there was rumors of buzz. I don't know if it shoots very Leverett, but it was one of the two. Um, and so the short story is um, looking at multiple options. So one option would be that shoots and Leverett Elementary School students might ride the bus with Leverett and Shootsbury secondary students, uh, because actually the time works out pretty well for a drop off at Shootsbury Leverett Elementary School and then the ride down to the regional middle school and high school. So that's one option that's being explored. Uh, another option that's being explored is depending how many students from Shootsbury and Leverett choose transportation um, to take either van service or something like that. Uh, and the least preferable option, I think, from the student's point of view is we could run the regional buses at the typical, what's been the typical time. Uh, they would get there quite early um, and they, you know, could go to the cafeteria and have some supervised work session. However, I think that would greatly reduce the need for buses in Shootsbury and Leverett if they were the only students getting there that early um, and having a supervised work session that early in the morning, I don't think is anyone's plan. Uh, so that's our least preferred option, um, but our, now our transportation folks are reaching out to the transportation folks in Union 28 to try to work on, you know, preferably option A or option B uh, on that. You know, just with the drop off right now, how it's listed on Shootsbury and Leverett Elementary School, um, and since the number of students taking the bus both at the high school from those communities as well as from the elementary schools there is not very high and, and a lot of kids could sit with their sibling if they have a kid in the middle school and then a fifth grader. Um, you know, that's sort of our, you know, I don't know if I would say preferred option, but I think it's, it's becoming our preferred option because the timing works out actually perfectly. Um, and it reduces the number of runs, which is sort of better for the universe more generally. Um, but that, that's where we are on that. We're still working out the pieces and that's really where, you know, the high school team getting that information and, and by Monday, you know, sharing it with our transportation folks because uh, our transportation folks at that point will be done with the elementary runs 
uh, by the end of this week. Then next week is to dig into the regional runs once we have that data from the middle school, high school, and Summit Academy. Um, so there's several hands and the order that I saw them raised was Mr. Sullivan, Ms. Spitzer, and Ms. Kenny. So Mr. Sullivan. So I only had one concern, but now I now that I've heard the bus thing, I have two. So I guess with that option of the elementary riding with the high school, that'll be one way we can get most of our elementary kids to get a ride to school. Because I don't know how many parents are really, I mean, I don't know how many want to put, because that's that conversation we had about sixth graders riding with the high school kids and even going into the middle school. So that, Mr. Demling, that changes my vote a little bit, but anyway. Um, so my, my question about the high school was about the academic skills, because my former student, that was, she relied on that almost on a daily basis to get through her day. And if you're blocking that all into one block, I don't know what kind, what kind of one-on-one um, -on -one or one-on-three or you know, what the ratio would be, but that's really going to cut into some of the students and the needs that they have with their liaisons. So I'm happy to take that. Um, that's a great question. So um, one thing to know is that this year, by running a three by three, students actually have three courses to manage at once. Some students have elected the D block, but many students um, have used the D block for their special education services, though not all of them. So what our liaisons have already done is they've divided their caseloads into those three half hour segments. And so what we're looking to do is just provide students with the same level of services that they've already received. It's just that some students might have to have that half hour shifted to either the 2.30 time or switch into one of the other two cohorts, depending on how many students on a caseload come in person versus how many students are still remote. So would, nobody will be losing any service time. But that sounds like you'd be asking students from Shootsbury to possibly hang out after the end of the, at 2.30. Two okay, so I'm, I'm so glad you're saying this because I'm sure this is what's on other people's minds as well. So what we're actually doing is taking students who are, who are going to remain remote who right now might have their academic skills say at 1150. So those remote students will then have their academic skills. I see you shaking your head, so I think you get it. But just for anyone else, because I think that's an excellent question, it actually allows us to just shift the remote students to the 230 and then put more of the in-person during that lunch block. Again, it's all relative to the total numbers that we get, but the way it's working out right now with the one third, we're very hopeful that we can accomplish that. Ms. Fitzer. Thanks, and thank you so much for this presentation and all the work I'm sure has gone into this. Um, sorry for the baby in the background. Um, the, the question I have is I'm, I am certain you probably described this in an earlier presentation, but with the D block, is that a time for elective style classes? Could you just explain for the school committee who might not have high schoolers a little bit more about that? And then my second question is, from what I'm inferring um, is that we're going to be moving into a, a model where the teacher, whether it's a social studies teacher, an English teacher, is gonna be simultaneously teaching the remote students and the in-person students. And I know this was something we had worked really actively to try to avoid. And I feel like Desi has really pushed us in, in, into this position. So it's not a criticism. I just wanted to make sure that that's what I'm hearing and ask like, do you have what you need in terms of technology and things like that? Or is the district going to need to um, spend more money or, or make any other shifts in order to accommodate this big change in the style of remote um, teaching and in-person teaching. And, and for, so one last follow-up is, I'm assuming there are gonna be some instances where there, it sounds like in most of the cases, the teacher's gonna be in person and the remote students are the ones who are going to be, you know, um, receiving the, the um, education remotely, but it, it also seems like you could potentially have in-person students whose teachers have, um, for whatever reason, needed to remain remote. So are these students going to be like in a classroom where maybe the teacher's um, pr presenting over a Zoom call or, or sorry, a Google Meet? Thank you. 
So I'm happy to jump in and take the easiest part of that question, which is the first one. Um, and so the way we've set up the schedule is with the three by three. The idea was that most high school students would elect, would take their five core academics, so math, social science, English, and world language. And that would leave another block, which would be the sixth block, for something else, so electives and so forth. But then, because some classes are double blocked or some students are musicians and you know needed music plus their academics and they had, say, AP, uh, BC calculus that was double blocked, we created these, what we called these D blocks, the seventh block. And that was really to help students, especially, you know, special education students who like, um, like it was mentioned that that becomes such an important part of their day. So we wanted to offer that and we didn't want to mandate it, but for students who needed that seventh block to really fulfill a schedule that those students took that. And so a lot of students took health or someone who just really, really loved art and wanted to take a D block um, painting class. We allowed for that as well. So that that's kind of how the electives work. But for many students, they took five core and then two quarter electives. And so they had those five core plus two electives. And so the three by three worked for those students. So I'll take the second part of that. Is that right, Mick? Is that what you hoped for? OK. <laughs> um, so Ms. Spitzer, that second part of that question you were asking is a very complex question and I appreciate it. Um, so in order to maintain sort of equitable pedagogy here, we are gonna have to run, um, so if you can picture a teacher in the front of the room um, running a Google Meet on their laptop, but facing the students, okay? And so in, in that Google Meet, you will have students that are remote um, and then there, there will also be students that are in the classroom, okay? And so there is a chance that, that we are going to struggle with bandwidth here, but we're working really hard on this. And we, I, we just met with Jerry Champagne about this and we're hoping to add more access points and to put some more drops. All of that language might be um, harder to understand, but, but we, we also know that it may be a challenge. And given that, um, I'm imagining we may have to choreograph something else, which includes putting the Chromebooks at half mast so that the students um, that are in the room um, aren't using the input and output um, data, so the upload and downloading data. Um, sometimes we may have to turn cameras off, but our hope is that we can at least um, project the faces of all the students that are remote. The challenge is going to be, can the remote students see the students that are in class? Um, so that may be more information that you wanted, but I think we're doing enough um, sort of evaluation of the systems right now to to um, make this work. It's but it is complex. You're right. Um, we didn't really want to be in in exactly this position, um, but here we are. Miss Cameron, do you mind if I add to that um, just a little bit? So I think yeah. I mentioned at the beginning that we've doubled our bandwidth, which does have financial considerations. Um, as someone who assigns lots of POs, um, I, I, I see the results of that. Um, today I signed POs um, around adding drops, uh, adding, you know, so adding specific places where Wi-Fi can go out, um, both inside and then, you know, potentially expanding that a little bit outside the building. But I think the thing, you know, if it's okay with you and if you disagree with me, any of the high school folks, um, you know, one might ask, why are we doing this differently than we're doing at some of the other schools? And it's because there are so many courses that are, you know, singleton or offered um, in, in small group or like, you know, there's not like fifth grade where, yeah, we might have to transition kids to a new fifth grade, but we've got eight fifth grade teachers across our district. And they're all wonderful, but and they're not interchangeable, but we can put students with an in-person or a remote fifth grade teacher based on their choice. There's no way to do that at the high school level, right? You know, because if if we have students in BC calculus and the teacher happens to be in person, the student chooses remote, we can't say on May 3rd or April 26th, whatever, we can't say, oh, I'm sorry, you can't finish your calculus course because your teacher's in person, right? It would just eliminate the option. So the reason we're having to do this model issue reference, which again is not ideal is that the alternative is kicking kids out of courses based on their choice of in-person or remote. And, and I think we'd all agree that ethically we can't do that, right? Um, and, and I think it's particularly acute at our high school. If you look at our program of studies, um, it's one of the things I'm most proud about. I, 
I take no ownership because I do nothing to contribute to it. But if you look at our program of studies, it's like a liberal arts college. It's amazing the amount of courses that we have. Um, there's not like, oh, you just take, you know, this course and then this course and this course and maybe senior year will get an elective, right? Our students are experiencing electives in core academic areas throughout their academic career. So there's a, a tremendous amount of upside to it. Um, the downside, you know, it's less efficient. And we hear that sometimes from town, town folks who are concerned about cost, that there's some truth in that. Uh, the downside in this situation is that it doesn't really allow for, okay, well, we can transition you from the same course you were taking and offer it both in person and remote because we have enough sections to do that. That's not possible at our high school. So that's where we land with this sort of um, hybrid, this, the most overused word in schools in the last year, but, but this sort of hybrid model where we don't want to eliminate access for students. Um, and I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of the high school approach to have that block of time at the end of the day for students who are attending classes remotely uh, to have more access because the, the reality is, and, and, and this is not because we value them less, it's going to be a more removed opportunity. You know, I've had enough remote meetings with my administrative team over the last couple of years where you're going to hear lit literally and figuratively the students who are in person more, right? It's human instinct. And as much as you try to fight it, when someone's six or 12 or 18 feet away from you versus on a screen, it does feel different. So it's trying to best accommodate students regardless of the choice that they make about in person or remote. Um, and so this is sort of the, you know, the compromise we have to make, you know, if we were having an only remote option like we were an only in person option, uh, which the state is definitely pushing for next year, uh, that would sort of eliminate this piece, but that's not where we are. Um, and, and as you heard the numbers that Ms. Camera said before and, and Principal Sadiq kind of acknowledged uh, where we are right now, when we're at a two thirds, one third, you know, that's a lot of students that we want to you know, accommodate. And uh, just the other alternative that's very real is some, some high schools are just, some schools, not high schools exclusively, are just saying to remote students, yeah, we'll send asynchronous work home because the state has allowed us to be able to have that, you know, the, the time on learning requirements for being live instruction are going away. Um, but, you know, we don't feel like that's, you know, what we, we can do at this moment. We don't think that's in the best interest of our um, students, a third of our students who are attending remotely. Um, and so that's how we land in this model that we're trying to, to work through, where we're trying to give the greatest number of access to all of our students, um, greatest amount of access. So hopefully Sam Talb and Mickey, that, that rang yeah, a bell. No, I think that's context really matters as to why we would approach it this way. It and it's really about not changing courses in, in April or May for high school students. The stakes are really high in terms of grades and, and eliminating access to pathways um, would be a huge concern. Well, and frankly, our, our teachers aren't licensed, you know, cross departmentally or even sometimes within departments. The AP physics teacher, you know, cannot um, necessarily teach CP chemistry. Um, the other thing that I want to say is it's, it's sort of hard to imagine this, but I want to I want you all to keep in mind that the distance learning that we've set up is really pretty dynamic. Right. And so that distance learning. So it's still project based learning. It's still. Um, you know, the, the global online academy work that we, that we had done earlier in the year in terms of our professional development is really dynamic and is really wonderful. And so I, I, I imagine, you know, sitting here and thinking, you know, I'm going to be the teacher just looking at my computer and talking to the computer. That, that's not, you know, it, it's hard to picture um, the kinds of strategies that we are using, but there are a lot of them. Um, and so it still is project-based learning. It is not... Um, a teacher lecturing. It's not face-to-face -face lecture for 80 minutes all every period. That's that's not what we've you know been striving for. Mr. Denley. Yeah. So just briefly, um, I I really appreciate the approach to maximizing the quality of the remote experience and the in-person experience at the same time. Here, I think, uh, like Dr. Morris has said, we we could have if we wanted to, kind of mailed it in on on either end. Uh, and been completely state compliant. Uh, and it would have been a lot less work for you all. Um, uh, but so I, I really appreciate all the different uh, moving parts that have been going together. And it really speaks to the, the well-run organization of, of the high school team. Um, so uh, and this is probably more of a question for Dr. Morris, but uh, you know, feel free to jump in. I'm just in terms of the timing, um, you know, so I, I get that there's a lot to do. Um, just briefly, did, did, you, did you think about trying to hit April 26th or the 27th with one orientation day? Um, 
was it just a matter of it felt too rushed or or were there insurmountable obstacles whether that was transportation or operations or or scheduling or whatnot that, that just made it impossible to hit that date um I, I think i think a lot of the items you've said that you don't have to repeat all of them are very reasonable i, I just i'm just kind of conveying is still a sense from from some parents that um that it feels long when they when they think about may it feels like it's the end of the year um and it's um it's certainly desi's fault for being this late uh to the demand <laughs> um um, and I, I and you're you're correct for moving before they tell us to do it. And I mean, they did say they would give us two weeks, which is very generous of them. But um, it's it's good to go. It's good to go ahead now. Um, so if you could just did you try to hit that date? And and then what were the you know what prevented that? I can start, and anyone can. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you can start. Go ahead, Principal Sadiq. I'm sorry. Thanks. So I'm thinking about um, the 26th, which is the the Monday after April break. It's hard just imagining having teachers and students who haven't been in the building in a year both showing up for the first time at the same time. Teachers need time to really get their classroom set. We allow them time before school starts after the summers to really get their classroom set up to be welcoming and as inviting and feel as comfortable for the students as possible. And after all this time out of the building and again adjusting from the teaching remotely to now teaching in person, it's because we're not going to be able to get everything, all those things done until spring break, because we're still going to have the different programs in the classroom. So we can't physically move a lot of the furniture back into those classrooms until the spring break happens when all of the programs will be out of the building. And then again, a lot of the other things that I've listed before all are going to get done during that spring break time. And teachers don't work during the spring break, so they're still going to need time to arrange their classrooms. Yeah, and if I could add to that, thank you, Principal Sadiq. Um, I think uh, the other piece that's, you know, more complex, all due respect again to Principal Sloven and, and Principal Sharon who are on the line, is we're talking about 550 kids roughly uh, coming into the space. Um, I think Principal Sadiq's point about the not forcing intensive needs students to move before they need to uh, is important. Uh, but it's a lot of students who have the most complex schedules um, to sort out over time. And so I, I think there is some real concern from the team that, when we, when, you know, it's mostly them, I won't take a lot of ownership again of this one, but when the team tries to put together all the schedules, all the special needs pieces that were spoken about before, uh, all the ELL needs, uh, that the complexity of the scheduling 560 students to be in and 200 some odd students to be out uh, among multiple academic skills courses, you know, it's a different challenge than what our other schools face. And, you know, I said this, I think, at the, the elementary level, if our schools didn't have ELL students, English learners didn't have students with special needs, our schools would be less good, uh, our students would have a worse experience, and it'd be much easier to schedule. You know, the reality is our, our values are that we don't try to do things unless it, we feel like we're ready for every student to receive the fullness of their education. And I think the complexity at the high school level of making sure all students' schedules are fully aligned, that they know what their schedules are, they know the adults they're working with, um, you know, the logistics, maybe we could go faster on. I mean, I get the point, you know, you implied it, but I'll just say it explicitly, Mr. Demling. Um, it's not for lack of uh, adults being able to get spaces ready. That is very true. But for us, you know, it's getting it ready for the kids. And if we're not ready for all, every single kid in the high school, then we feel like it's, it's too quick to open. And I think given the complexity and the quantity of the students, that's where we really get to the place of, of wanting to be, you know, again, four days later, perhaps than uh, you know, or five days later than, than what I've definitely heard feedback on. I've heard the same feedback you have, Mr. Demling. So, and I think the high school has, uh, admin team has as well. Um, but I think that, that sort of the thinking was, would we really be ready to receive every single student uh, who wants to be in person at every student remote? Would we have all the technology ready for them? Um, and, you know, that's, that's sort of the summary, not just of the team here, but also the operational side in terms of transportation. Uh, technology, which was asked about, and I know um, it's still, you know, we just ordered a number, for instance, just the small things of just making sure that no one's relying on, no, the teacher's relying on Wi-Fi, so can everyone have a laptop that connects to the to the network? Like, you know, all these number of things, none of them in isolation seem like a dramatic amount, uh, but the reality is we weren't anticipating this model until two weeks ago, right, in terms of five days a week, and that really shifted things. If we were in a hybrid model, you know, I, I don't. I, I honestly don't think we'd have any trouble going the week earlier, but we're not talking about a hybrid model here. I think uh, Assistant Principal Kramacki was going to add one thing. 
uh, if that's okay, Ms. McDonald. Yeah, can I just, yeah, the one thing also with regard to the um, fourth quarter beginning on the 26th, so again, that was the, the target date for us. Unfortunately, the five days prior to that, we, you know, there's nobody available. So we would actually, we have a huge materials turnover to do for the fourth quarter as well. And we would have students coming back into the building who have never met their teacher because we changed teachers on the, for the fourth quarter. So that week actually allows us to get the fourth quarter going for teachers to meet their students online, prepare them for coming in. And it also allows us to return all the materials from third quarter and then turn over the materials for fourth quarter. So that was another compelling reason for needing a couple extra days that week. Ms. Kenny. Um, okay, so I've, I've gone back and forth about even asking this question because um, I'm going to sound difficult, right? And that's not my intention. And I very much appreciate all of the work that has gone into all of this. I guess I am not understanding. So you're changing the quarter anyway on the 26th. So whether you're going to be going into classrooms where you've never met a teacher before anyway. So does it matter really if it's in your bedroom where you've been taking your classes or if it's in the classroom? Um, and so I, I understand the like, you know, it's a change for everybody, but it's going to be a change for everybody, whether it's on the third or it's on the 26th. You know, these kids have not been in school, like we said before, a, over, for over a year by this point, right? Um, so. And my other concern is, I mean, our hope at, at any point was to have children back in the classrooms, right? Like even at any point during this year. Um, so would this have been what happened if say the metrics all came together on, you know, in January, would we have like, no, we have to push it out again because it, it, it it feels like we were unprepared for children to be coming back into the classrooms. Sure. I don't think you're sounding difficult and I'll, I'll try to take that one. At, um, so I think none of our plans in terms of the MOA this year had the high school in five days a week. And so I think what, what feels really different to, to the team is that that wasn't, when we're talking about two days a week, uh, if you would go back to the MOA, we wouldn't be needing this many classrooms. We wouldn't be planning for this much um, use of the building. Um, and, and that has really shifted uh, all of the planning because we were planning based on a model that was agreed to that we were hoping metrics or otherwise we were gonna implement uh, until we got uh, a directive that wasn't from you all, it was from DESE that was suggesting five days a week, which means a, a doubling of use of the building uh, and a much different level of programming than what we were planning on before. So, I mean, I, I wanna be honest that the committee has the opportunity and if, if you feel like you wanna, you know, push this to an earlier date, that's, that's certainly in your control. And I started this by suggesting that this was asking for more flexibility from you all than what you originally voted. And I think the reason for that is really the shift from a hybrid model to a full in-person model uh, and, and the time it takes to do that well um, is really different. Um, so all year, the planning that we were doing was not for a five days a week model because that wasn't what was agreed to. Um, and I think that's the piece that uh, feels different to us. And, you know, certainly the school committee has the authority to make the, dead, make the timeline different than, you know, what's being proposed tonight. But I think the reason we're bringing up the, the differences is because we had uh, a couple weeks notice for a pretty rapid change to everything that the, had gone into the planning for the school year. And that's really, again, different than what you're gonna hear at the other, other grade levels for other schools. You know, and I'm not trying to convince you, just to be really clear, uh, Ms. Kenny, I'm just trying to explain the rationale and certainly any of the high school folks can jump in, but I think, I think it is, and, and it has operational and educational implications that uh, would feel different. If it was like, no, we're not gonna go one day a week, we're gonna go at two days a week. I don't think we're having this conversation this way tonight. Because uh, I think that change is not as significant a change as going from a hybrid to a full in-person model. Okay, so it's just to make sure I'm understanding clearly. It's more about that it's going from a possibility of a two-day hybrid to a five-day. 
Um, okay, I can understanding. I, I can understand. I can understand that needing a little more space. Um, but you know, we've talked about like having it. It be more like the other pieces, right? Like the transportation or the scheduling, like those pieces are gonna have to happen anyway. Sure, right? so that's a good example on the operational side. So on the transportation side, when you're talking about a two day week model, you're, you're having half the number of students that you would have ride the bus as compared to this model. For the food service, you're talking about 200 some odd meals instead of 500 some odd meals, right? Um, so in addition to the educational pieces, which is pushing us to this kind of uh, using both live, you know, having students attend both live uh, in person as well as hybrid or as well as remotely at the same time. Uh, all the operational pieces, all the bandwidth pieces, all of those pieces have doubled in the last two weeks. And I think that that's some of the operational challenges and certainly tell Mickey and Sam can speak to any of the educational pieces if you, there's other things you'd like to add. But I think that's, you know, we weren't planning on moving the distance learning students, you know, students who've been in since December we were saying we have plenty of space for two days a week. We have no problem. Yes, people may not get quote unquote their rooms. And I want to be sensitive because some people have a lot of identity in their room. They spend a lot of time setting up the room. But the reality is we had enough classrooms where we didn't have to think about that. Uh, all of a sudden, we're talking about uh, regrouping students who have been in, you know, some of our highest need students who have been in those spaces for the last four months. And, you know, that changes, that involves a number, a set of changes that uh, was not particularly predictable uh, where we were a couple weeks ago before Desi made their announcement. Okay, and um, as far as the students that are already in the building, having them, I mean, from what I'm understanding, I think they're going to be relocating anyway. Though they're just going to be in different spaces, and having that happen at a more natural break, like vacation works out better for those students particularly right because their learning model is not changing until the rest of the building is changing but their loc their location is will be changing it will have earlier to. right like I, from it sounds like the week of vacation the building is being rearranged and then they'll have a week in their new spaces and then the following week, the other in-person learning students will be coming back. Right, so that's most so having that week in their, in their new spaces without more humans will make that transition easier. That's it, yeah. Okay. And, and, and again, there's a lot of moving pieces and I think, you know, we're open to divergent opinions on this. I think this is the recommendation of a timeline that that the team feels like will work best for kids. Um, but, you know, it's not to say that the school committee couldn't have a different opinion on that. And that's why we're talking about it tonight. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> you certainly weren't difficult, Ms. Kenny. So please don't <laughs> apologize. I think it's, it's asking more questions and getting to a conclusion, whatever your conclusion or the committee's is in the end, we can only get there if you're asking questions that are trying to elicit you know, a better understanding because all this is incredibly complex. Okay, well, thank you. So we've been, um, we had a lot of, I think, um, 50 minutes for all three schools and we were at 45 minutes with one. So, <laughs> but these are all, all good questions. And I am, um, I think a lot of people were probably were mulling over the same questions that Ms. Kenny just asked as well. So, um, so um, thank you for explaining that in, in all the gory detail for us. Um, are there any last questions before concerns before we move on to where we is um, are we moving on to Summit Academy now? Yeah. Okay. Not seeing any. Okay. So uh, thank you, um, Ms. Sadiq and uh, Gramaki and Kamara. Thanks. So we'll try to be briefer with our last two. Uh, the advantage of the disadvantage of going first, sorry for our high school folks who are departing. The good news is you get to go to bed or do whatever you're going to do. The bad news is, you know, you got the most energy uh, earlier in the night. So 
Uh, you can think of that however you do. But um, Dave, would you like me to bring up the Summit Academy slides? Sure, that'd be great. Yep, and so I will do that. Um, this one, just to be clear, is the only one that doesn't involve a deviation from either DESE or the school committee vote. Um, so um, or, uh, let's see, Summit Academy, there we are. Um, so and we, we can be very, very quick. I, yeah. I do want to thank the high school administration. Their leadership has really supported our own thinking and makes it easier for us as a as a school next to a school to to get done what you know our vision uh, of a school is and so i just want to give a, a real applause to to that uh, to the administration so thank you guys i, I really appreciate it so they they're often leading and they are thinking about us and um and we're able to kind of meet our mission um with that leadership so thank you guys um so like mike said we're we have a couple things going on one is that we're going to have a distance learning center which is you know something new but uh on april 5th because we have volunteer staff willing to come in and uh we've talked to families again we are very different from the high school our numbers are so small comparatively but uh the the level of need is high and um our mission is about uh creating uh, relationships in a safe space and at the same time giving the highest um, comprehensive kind of uh, uh, academic rigor that, that uh, we can and we are able to do. So, um, so, so if you'll see the timelines and the rationales, everything's different, but you know, really working on April 5th for a distance learning and right now it looks like it's gonna be on the range of 10 students and then we're looking to return on Monday, April 26th, um, using all our spaces. We're gonna have to, we were using a couple of the high school spaces, which we were, are going to have to give up again because they're just getting a lot of uh, students back. Um, you know, uh, it, it looks like, you know, when we get full-time staff on the 26th, the numbers will probably go up to maybe 15. And I, uh, I foresee that we'll be able to keep that six feet of distance. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really, really proud of our students and our staff. And one of the things that um, we had this great presentation as Dr. Morris talked about from uh, Kimmy Carlos. And, and it's often you hear about people having, you know, as long as they have a relationship with one teacher or one adult, I'm proud to say that your Summit Academy, all those students have more than one adult close relationship with, it's usually five, six and more. And we, we spend a lot of time creating that and uh, we're all excited to kind of come back and we're gonna have students staying remote. And those students, uh, we've been able to continue to have a community-like feel um, and, um, and that's what we're, uh, I'm most proud of because you hear from the students and uh, we're able to just maintain the level of commitment we have uh, for the students and the staff supporting the, the staff. And so, Mike, you can go to the next slide. Um, our blocks are, we're, we're gonna keep the same schedule um, that we currently have. Um, we, you know, if you look at that 1220 to 1255 is, it's, it, we don't say it, but it's actually our D block. Um, of course, it's before C. Um, and that's really a lot of our therapeutic groups, our community meeting and our directed support and advisory occur. We've unfortunately had to get rid of some of our, our great electives just because it's just, the, the, you know, the numbers game. But we've been able to uh, meet all the students' requirements. We have a uh, huge senior class this year that we are absolutely proud of who have been um, gearing up for their, their graduation, but are, are headed out into lots of different places, but the, the schedule will remain the same. Um, and we're, we're, we're proud about that because it, it also meets up with the high school schedule for the most part. And we do have students who take high school courses. Uh, we did a frequently asked questions as well. Um, pretty much the same kind of pieces. 
trying to think of any differences. You know, Summit Academy students will come right to Summit Academy um, in the morning. We will we'll probably be able to have, have them come in because that's part of how we acclimate in the morning, just checking in with students. Um, but we're looking at 850 as well. Um, you could go to the next one. I, I don't see any major differences there. We, we did talk a little bit about the MCAS. For us, MCAS is really important because we want to give such individualized support and, and, and the feel that the kids are able to do their best. One of the questions was, you know, it is going to be in person. So even if you're a remote student, we, we, we will be opening up for those students who want to take the MCAS. Um, and, you know, and that's, that's, that's the quick version. Um, I can't say enough that how proud we are of our students and uh, their ability to maintain and access. I'm really, I'm so thankful for our clinicians. We have such an active school every single day, starting at 730 with our, our community chats. And uh, we're just lucky to be able to support uh, the families uh, in a real significant way all day long. And I think we'll continue to do that, even though we will we'll have the same pedagogy issues, same bandwidth. But remember, it's all smaller and, um, and we'll deal with those as they come about. Any questions? Questions from the committee? Mr. Sullivan. I'll be brave and ask one. How's the greenhouse? Great question. Um, it's, you know, it's so funny. I was, I, I'm there every day and I got to see a couple students today and I was walking them around and it looks like our teacher has been coming by and uh, getting it ready for, for students, but it's been inactive, unfortunately. But we're, it'll, it's one of our best classes is our food science class. And it's all related to what we do. And um, that's, that's kind of in, in the works for the spring. And we also have some gardens that we're thinking about. And I really appreciate that, uh, Mr. Sullivan, as a question. I think Ms. Stancer has her hand up if you can't see Ms. McDonald. Yep, Ms. I just saw it. Thanks, Ms. Stancer. Um, I don't have a question. I want to say that I just appreciate the passion that you have for what you're doing. Thank you. It's uh, we have some incredible kids, and you know, you know, uh, Mr. Sullivan talks about this. I would love for our leadership, our student government, to get another chance to come and talk with you guys. I'm just so proud of these seniors and these students, um, and I mean that. that I just I want them to do the do the talking. I think it's just, uh, we have some of the smartest, the brightest, most talented students in the school. And uh, sometimes that's overlooked. And, and I got to tell you, it hurts every once in a while when you hear the stigma that some people still hold on to. And, um, and I'm realizing that we really have to put some of the academy out there so everybody can get to know it uh, better. And so I think we're ready given our third year at, 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 uh, at the high school. And, so you'll be, look for us. That's what I say, look for us. Yeah. If I could add to that, just uh, the context, which some newer members may not know, is that a couple of years ago, two members of the, the two heads of the student council came to the regional school committee meeting. Um, and they, this, you know, in to protect confidentiality, it wasn't part of the filmed part of the meeting. Um, and, but it was incredibly powerful. Uh, to have those students come and describe the summit experience. So I think that'd be great again. And, and uh, you know, I think it more than anything you, even you could say, Dave, or certainly I could say, hearing the students talk about summit was an eye-opening eye experience for, uh, for I think everyone on the committee at that point. So if you weren't on the committee, that's what's being uh, explicitly referenced by Principal Slovin. It's a great, great suggestion. Thank you. Ms. Stancer, did you have another question? Okay. Thank you, Principal Sloan. And 
Moving on to um, middle school. Yep, and Principal Sharon, would you like me to project the slides again? Please, I'd appreciate that. Yep, get them going. So just my uh, setting up of this is that this one does not require any modification from what school committee previously voted. However, it would require a waiver, waiver request from Jesse um, because it, it would have the return date consistent with what the school committee voted, uh, but the, it would be a phasing into the five-day model, uh, which I understand from articles actually just this afternoon has been already approved in multiple districts in Massachusetts that were fully remote to, to phase from hybrid into um, five days in person. So with that, I will get the presentation up and hand it over to you, Principal Sharon. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks to the school committee for uh, their engagement here. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm uh, proud of with this presentation, if you'll just go to the next slide, is that uh, it's really been a collaborative process. And uh, even though it's, it, you know, not everyone has been working on this with me is here. Uh, we's, we've been spending a lot of time together and it's been a great opportunity to collaborate closely with a group of teachers and administrators and people in different roles in the school. Um, and, and that's been, um, I think, because there's a rep representation from different parts of the school, it really uh, makes it feel like a, it's a good process. If you go to the next slide. Uh, I want to just outline the main parts of this and basically, um, <clears throat> as you'll see, one, one of the things that uh, Mike outlined was this idea of having a hybrid program that we phase in, right? And so what it would mean is seventh graders would be there on Mondays and Tuesdays and eighth graders would be there on Thursdays and Fridays and that'd be for the first two weeks. And then after two weeks, we move to a five-day uh, regular week. Uh, and, uh, and one of the big pieces that we're seeing in that is an advantage is the opportunity to have some uh, purposeful planning about the orientation for those two separate groups of students, particularly given the events that have occurred this year. They've had fundamentally different experiences, not only of the middle school itself, um, but also of each other. And so the, the kind of orientation or reorientation would be really different and having them in different places. I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, not being there at the same time would allow us to, for example, walk around with seventh graders in small groups uh, without, you know, do, doing that a lot easier than having it also a shared space with eighth grade. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so that's a lot of what this slide is about, is just really trying to address some of the questions about why I phase in. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've spoken with a lot of people, uh, including some healthcare professionals, um, and, uh, and I've gotten a lot of support for the idea of phasing in. And I think it's, it's as, as important for students as it is uh, for adults. Uh, and there's gonna be a lot that's gonna be new about the school experience. And I think it's going to be a, a good opportunity. And I think uh, in the planning, we've talked a lot about this uh, for people to practice um, coming back to school uh, and doing it in a relatively small dose. Next slide, please. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that before I just show you the schedule is that we have the schedule is very similar to the one that we currently have, which is an AB schedule. Uh, which means students will have core classes, uh, uh, two main core classes and longer classes on uh, every other day. Uh, if you want to share that schedule, uh, which is the next slide. This is an example of, of what the schedule will look like for the day for a seventh grader. Uh, and as you can see, it says core class. Uh, those might alternate between uh, a math science and a social studies English class. But those would fill in the spots and then the exploratories would be the shorter classes. Uh, one of the big differences between the schedule we currently have and this one is that we would put lunch, advisory and guided study in, uh, in the middle um, of the day. And 
that hasn't been a feature of our schedule. We've had advisory in the beginning, and that's been a way to check in at the beginning of the day with everyone, particularly in remote schooling. And so we feel like in in-person schooling, uh, we would be able to bundle these, and that would give us some advantages, which would include the ability to um, minimize the number of transitions throughout the day. Um, and uh, it would also give us an opportunity uh, to really try and leverage that those personal relationships with the advisory teacher uh, because they would also be working with them and, and working with students during guided study. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, we have an FAQ here. Um, and, uh, and one of the things I want to just point out here in particular, although I know you can read the rest of them, is that we are really working uh, with the idea of trying to maintain to the extent possible, uh, having six feet uh, social distancing in the classrooms. Uh, you know, we've played with a lot of numbers and it's really important and I can't, you know, underscore this enough. It's really important that we have accurate data about uh, who's coming and who's not, because that's going to really give us a sense of just how much we'll need uh, to prepare, how many students we'll need to prepare for in each class, and just how much we're able to maintain that distancing for students uh, in different parts of the school. Um, but we think because of the projection of 70% uh, that we're in looking at the opportunity to be able to plan for that and do that in a way that allows us to have um, you know, six feet is close, maintain close to six feet social distancing in most places. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. Uh, and again, this is, there's some questions here that some people have asked about. And, you know, one of the things that's difficult is, of course, uh, and this is a difference, another noteworthy difference between our program and the middle school, and I'm sorry, in the high school's program, is that uh, in our program, we plan to have a separate, uh, fully remote um, set of teachers working with students who are fully remote. Uh, and that would allow us to have the students who are in person working with teachers who are just working with students who are in person. And so we believe that that will give us the opportunity to leverage uh, that aspect of being in person, which is something we've all uh, really missed and, and not have to also manage that aspect of being a remote teacher as well. And uh, um, I think many of us who are educators know people who are in that role and have heard a lot of the challenges of working with that. And so we really wanna make this teaching uh, and this time with the teacher uh, in person for those students who choose that to be as meaningful and powerful as possible. And of course, I will say, and this kind of echoes one of the things that Sam shared earlier, which is that I'm really proud of the remote uh, curriculum we've set up this year. Uh, teachers have worked very hard to do that, and for uh, families who choose that, uh, they'll be able to maintain uh, remote uh, a remote option, obviously. So Mike, is there anything I missed? No, okay, and so and so basically, we're planning on sending a survey out to the community tomorrow, uh, with you know this basic information included in it. So they'll have this information uh, to do that. Uh, we think it's important to try and get uh, this opinion or this information out to families as soon as possible, and to try and get that information back because it's really important to help us in our planning, uh, and uh, of course. Uh, uh, the planning committee that you saw uh, working with me is still working with me on an ongoing basis and we've been working planning for about five hours a week um, and we've gotten a lot done already and we feel like we have a lot of clarity about where we're headed uh, but we're also working separately from that group uh, through admin primarily uh, on coordinating all the aspects of site that um, you heard about uh, in Talib's presentation. Um, but again, I really appreciate the collaboration and I'm really proud of the collaboration that's happened between the middle school and high school uh, and even working with Dave Sullivan and, and, you know, really inspired by their leadership 
and and aided by their support as well as Mike's. So thank you. Yeah, if I could clarify, if I could add one thing uh, just at the end. So when the middle school surveyed families about return to school, it was, I believe, the day before, maybe the night before Desi came out with their announcement. We were ready it was actually the day of. It was about two of, hours. Right? two hours before the, the announcement. Yeah, so you can't make that up. So I think the additional survey is to gather final information with this plan because we have heard just very bluntly from families who are interested in a hybrid return but have no desire to return for the five days uh, for the full time. There may also be families who feel the other way that now that they know that there's uh, a five-day option, they may want to come in. So we will expect that there will be some shifting. Um, you know, I think when the original survey went out with the with the two day, you know, a hybrid model, we were also felt much more confident about six feet of distancing, whereas now it's, it's definitely something we're aspiring to. So, you know, we, we do want to get back out to families to confirm choices um, because some of the information is different. Uh, actually, a lot of the information is different than what first went out to middle school families. Um, so, you know, I just want to say that continued outreach is because the, the initial outreach, you know, we think most people will stay with the same choice, but we also, I've heard directly from families, and I know um, Principal Sharon has as well, uh, who, um, if it's not gonna be hybrid for the rest of the year, they, they do not plan to send their child, even though originally on the survey they did because the survey was asking solely about hybrid because that's where we were at that moment. So, you know, it's, if, if we learned anything this year, it's once you do something, you, something else changes and you gotta do a very similar thing again. And I think in the middle school's case, the timing was was quite a bit awkward, but um, you know we'll we'll continue to do outreach, and the more information we share, and the clearer the information is, the better uh, and more accurate the responses will be. So that was the, the only thing I was going to add to um, the middle school piece before there's um, questions or comments. Thank you. Sorry, I have one uh, question. Um, some, it was asked earlier about the bus for um, for the high school, and and so I noticed that the start time at the middle school is. 10 minutes earlier than the building opens at um, at the high school. So how how is that um, how is that transportation? Because presumably you're not. It it seems like it would take a lot longer or a lot shorter to get from one point A to point B. Maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. So I mean, I think students will enter the building around 8:40. The reality is a much higher percentage, almost twice as many of middle schoolers said they were going to take the bus than the high schoolers. Um, just bluntly, there's not many high schoolers who are planning to take the bus. Um, so uh, I think we have a little more flexibility there, whereas at the middle schoolers, it's uh, very similar to elementary, actually. It was uh, just a shade under a half. The middle schoolers are taking the bus, so we can be um, a little more directive on the start time. Um, and we need to be because the buses will arrive at the high school where I believe it was under a quarter of students suggested they were going to take the bus. Um, they may get there a little earlier, and that's where the high school team was talking about, you know, some supervised outside time and opening up the doors at 850 for kids to come in. Um, but just even in a raw number of way, there's just not many high school students who indicated that they plan to come in and take the bus, whereas the middle school, um, it, it's, a, it's about half. Mr. Demlin. Uh, so two questions. Thank you very much for this. Um, you're in the same boat as the high school where Desi radically altered what our plans were. Um, and so I, I really appreciate the, the, the proactiveness of, the, of all this. Um, so my, my first question is on if, students choose the in-person option but then don't like it can they switch back to remote so at the high school the answer is yes but it wasn't clear on the survey so can, can you talk about what but at the elementary is a completely different story um so so what's the um situation with the middle school you're muted i think uh diego thank you so it is it is both uh, true and 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 appropriate to say that, uh, like the high school did, that the planning for this is a lot of work, right? And so, and so, if we have some expectation about students coming, and then there's a change that's significant, it could really impact our planning. Uh, it can it can also really impact the experience of students, uh, and so that's why uh, that information is really important. You know, we, we really do want to provide choice, uh, but we also want to make sure that, that when people are communicating a choice, it's really what they're uh, choosing uh, uh, and they're making a, a commitment to that choice, uh, you know, along with that. And so um, so I guess the, the real answer to that is that we would ask that people uh, respond in that way. 
uh, and that they would uh, uh, really think about what their response is going to be uh, and make a choice. Uh, the reality is that uh, Diego, I can let me. I, I'm going to say it more bluntly than you. Yeah, That's go ahead. I feel more enabled, uh, perhaps, to do that because I've, I've I've been at this rodeo a couple times. Um, we are not allowing for choice, right? Um, so because the middle school is on the very similar model to the elementary where there are distinct remote classes and distinct in-person classes, once we get shifting, then all of a sudden we have the wrong number of adults to support the wrong number of kids in some model. Uh, and, and the major concern we have is that if we have shifting, then all of a sudden the remote, let's say it was shifting from in-person to remote, we care about the remote kids. We're not making remote classes like 40 students large. You know, Frankly, that's happening around the country. We're not doing that. Uh, and we can't allow for that. I think when we allow for flexibility and choice, unfortunate uh, to change choices, unfortunately, people will hedge their bets, right? And we've seen that in many districts. At the high school, the reason we're able to be more flexible is because it's, to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter. We're not able to be flexible with remote coming in person because of the health and safety pieces. But if a student who's coming in person goes remote, it actually doesn't change the number of adults needed anywhere, right? It, it, it remains the same. Uh, but the middle school is much more in the elementary model where we really can't have that shifting around um, because it really, then we need to have, we have the wrong number. Again, the class sizes get wacky. Uh, we're trying to do things as equitably as we can. So I'm sorry for being that blunt, Diego, but I felt like I, I I'm, have a little bit of ability to, to do that uh, at this point. And certainly you, you, you can, but I've, I feel very enabled um, to do that. But Thanks, uh, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, so it's the same, because it's the same, it's basically hinging on the same model as elementary where there's, as Diego said, there's remote classes and in-person classes. Anything that affects that actually throws off the whole model. So we're just, we're asking people what they wanna do and that's why the additional outreach is there because when people committed at first, they weren't committing to five days in person. Uh, and, and that's why we need to get more accurate data before we move forward. Mr. Sullivan? Yeah. I I'm just curious. We just approved five sports for the high school for the spring. And, I, you know, I've been talking about being worried about the socio-emotional wealth, health of all of our, our seventh and eighth graders, especially the seventh graders who have never been in that school before. And I'm just wondering if there's any way that there'll be any clubs or sports or any act after school activities that students could choose to join because they, these kids may know their classmates from the screen, but you've got four towns coming together for the first time where some students have never been, at least in Shoots Bay, have never been down the hill because they go to other places in Franklin County. So I'm just curious if there's any way that we can do any clubs or sports or anything to help these kids mix before they come back for the eighth grade. Well, you know, uh, there are uh, currently clubs that do happen, and there are also a number of sports that will be happening that are available uh, for middle school students to participate in. Uh, and so there are a lot of options that are, you know, that are going to be happening. Um, they weren't in the presentation about uh, athletics. Um, I think Ms. Stewart may have mentioned it, uh, which sports there were middle school options for. I don't have it in front of me, but I know she mentioned that, you know, about, it sounded like about half the sports have middle school options, whether it's middle school specific team or that some middle school students, particularly eighth graders, could, could opt up and play uh, with the high school, um, like the JV team or their counterparts. It's not the full complement, but there are some. Right. And, and, you know, in addition, we are, we are having conversations about additional opportunities that students can have to kind of uh, be with one another in a social setting outside, uh, socially distanced after school and things like that. Uh, and there's a number of teachers who were talking about trying to kind of put, put a committee together to specifically look at that. And so that's something that we're uh, wanting to enable for sure. Ms. Kenny. Um, okay, I have I have a couple of questions again. Um, so in a normal non-COVID year, <laughs> how much 
opportunity do seventh graders have to see the middle school before day one, right? They have they have a day where they go in sixth grade for a portion of the day, some of the day, all of the day. And then seventh grade doesn't start before eighth grade, right? There's it's not like when kindergarten, right, is a different starts a different day than first grade, right? Seventh and eighth graders start on the same day, normal non-COVID years. No, seventh grade starts a day before. Eighth grade No, it starts like, the same. It starts the same. So like Seventh grade starts on Monday, eighth grade also starts on Monday, right? So yes. in, in a normal non-COVID year, seventh graders have one day where they go with their sixth grade class and tour the middle school. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's, so it, it, it's a little different, yes. I mean, uh, you're right. I think one of the things that you're highlighting is that this isn't a normal uh, non-COVID year. Right. So, okay. So in a normal non-COVID year, they get one day with, say, the rest of the Pelham kids. So in this, with a two-week of hybrid to start, and it says, you know, purposefully orientating the seventh and eighth grade, like seventh graders to the middle school, and then the eighth graders have already been in the middle school, right? So I guess I can understand one week right, to try to, like, break things up a little bit, but I, I'm not understanding the two weeks. I mean, in all honesty, I would really like to see all the kids back for the 26th for five days. I think especially, you know, the seventh graders, as other people have mentioned, like, have never been in this, this school before and are from several of the towns coming from very small schools where there's one, I don't know about Leverett and Shootsbury if they have more than one sixth grade class, but yeah, okay. So they've been with the same 20 kids since, I, I mean, I'm sure some of them since they were 10 kids, nine kids, I don't know. So my nine daughter years. is in seventh grade and there are kids she has been in class with since she like was in preschool since she was three. It is time for her to meet some other children that she has not known for her entire life. <laughs> and the, you know, I, I appreciate like, um, I think Mr. Sullivan mentioned the sports to have, there were only a few that seventh graders could participate in. There were more that eighth graders could participate in. So there was enough at the high school level, but that doesn't offer a lot of opportunities for the seventh graders. Um, so having more time for them to be continued remote when there's going to be a remote team or an in-person team it seems to me like if you're ready for children to be coming to school on the 26th where all of the logistical pieces have been organized right like like the kids schedules and the bus routes and feeding them and all of those other parts and pieces that need to be worked out if they can start on monday the 26th then it, it feels like just pushing things further out for some children or in families we know that remote just is not working. Yeah, I can respond to that. So again, this is what we're bringing to the committee. I mean, I think you propose a different option, which is, you know, well, I heard one of two things, to be honest with you, and, maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one is to return full in person on the 26th. I think another thing was, I thought I heard was to suggest one week of remote, one week, excuse me, of hybrid, uh, and then come back on May 3rd fully in. So, I mean, I think, again, these are proposals that, there's a proposal that the middle school team wanted to bring to um, to this group. And again, that's where the feedback and, you know, want to see where the committee is on this. And that's, uh, the, we'll take the next steps with the committee's direction. Sorry, yes, to clarify, I can understand doing either one. Okay, sure, I wanted to make sure I captured what you <laughs> yeah, were saying correctly. I myself was not clear, I apologize, you know. <laughs> Mr. Demley. Yeah, so I was gonna say a similar thing, um, maybe it's because it's late, but I'll, I'll just be blunt. I don't, I don't see the justification for two weeks of phasing. Um, we're not doing phasing for um, other than one day for ninth graders at the high school. We're not doing phasing for students that have been 
um, not in the building for more than a year. And we're not doing phasing for younger students too at the elementary level. Um, you know, students that are less mature. Now, I've I've had three kids go through the middle school. I understand there's a different level of, of immaturity for seventh and eighth graders. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're not talking about all of them. Um, and I, I just don't see the cost benefit there. Um, in, in, in a normal COVID plan, I absolutely do. In fact, our committee talked at length and endorsed the uh, notion of of, of uh, a very extensive phasing, um, customized per grade across the months. Um, so, you know, I, I understand the benefit in concept, um, but the, the, the practical reality that the concern I'm coming from is that um, by April 26, we're gonna have two months left in the year, right? And, um, and, and I, 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 I'm struggling to see what, what a seventh or eighth grader gets from from that that second or third or fourth day of you should wear a mask and this is the way to walk down the hall and this is where your classroom will be like i feel like at that age they should kind of get that and if if we're not comfortable that those kids are going to be safe um you know wh wh whatever percentage of kids come back if it's you know say two-thirds of uh, or, or or ish of, of what we get at the high school if, if we're not comfortable the, the kids are going to be safe then, then, then we shouldn't be confident they're going to be safe two weeks later when they're all in the, in the building. So I just, I just, um, you know, I know, I know we're coming from a good place about wanting to make that transition as, as calm and as seamless as possible. But I just, I just think that maybe the knob of, um, of how gradual we we do that is 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 turned down a little a little too much here. Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, the um, the sports and club question. I hop on the Sarah Best bus, and it really I think you really do because it's such a short window, and these kids, the seventh graders have never been in there. That there's got to be I don't know if it's a cross country or a track, but there's got to be some way to get these kids that don't play competitive sports to get together without having to go up to Lime Red and all pile in at the same time. There's gotta be some way to get these kids acclimated to each other because like Miss Kenny was saying, you know, Shootsbury, we start talking in the fourth or fifth grade about how exciting it is to go down to the middle school because for nine, you could be spending nine years with the same 15 kids and the same one teacher every year. And this is the time to get out and do stuff and meet people. And so I'm hoping that you can find some way to help these kids meet each other. Dr. Morris. Yeah, so I mean, I think I definitely hear the tension uh, around the return piece. And I think that's understandable uh, completely. You know, I, I do think that there's some good logic thinking about adolescents uh, and the students that are uh, quite honestly in the middle, right? Uh, literally and figuratively in terms of their academic experience and, and, and needing some level of additional orientation that, that perhaps isn't as needed um, at the elementary uh, or at the high school level. So, you know, I think, you know, Ms. Kenny's suggestion of one week um, instead of two, you know, I think that that's something that, you know, I would hope the middle school is able to to be able to manage. I do think going straight in on the 26th um, does feel um, developmentally, I think that'd be a really hard thing. I have heard, you know, just candidly more concerns about uh, kind of fears of middle schoolers uh, coming from middle schoolers and actually I'm hearing from elementary or high schoolers about coming in person, even students who want to come in. And I think that's just developmentally appropriate, right? That's where many middle school students are. They're, you know, as one person unrelated to this uh, termed in an article is they're they're old enough to know sort of some of the scary side of COVID, um, but they're not old enough to really be able to interpret everything that's out there. And that's not true of every middle school student, but developmentally, that's where, you know, young adolescents are. So, you know, I think that idea that you came up with, like, to me is a reasonable compromise, you know, of, of allowing for uh, some level of orientation for seventh and eighth grade students, uh, while still kind of, um, kind of advancing students to be in the building five days a week, uh, a week sooner than what was originally proposed. So, you know, I, I don't know how the committee feels about that, but I feel like that's 
that's working towards a reasonable compromise that, that I think um, for families who are concerned about from the committee that uh, kind of responds to those needs, but also responds to the needs of making sure that students and staff uh, have that orientation time, which is just always more critical at the middle school level. I mean, I'll be honest that, you know, I've been to ninth grade orientations at the high school, you know, with students in the, you know, auditorium. Uh, I've been to the seventh grade ones and I've been to kindergarten ones and seventh grade ones are the hardest, right? The kindergartners are like amazed by everything in the world that they're seeing. Uh, the ninth grade students are, you know, um, they're, they're excited to be in high school, slightly intimidated by being in high school and seventh grade students. I think there, there's, it's a different experience. That's the only way I say it. And that's not critical of the kids or critical of the, the um, their experiences there, but um, it feels really different. You know, in, in the old days, you know, when we were in person, the high school principal would come down and, and uh, you know, Jean, did, Jean Jones did this last year and, and practiced graduation at the high school. And the reason that was symbolic was they're seventh graders and they're not thinking about graduating high school. And we want them to be thinking about graduating high school when they enter seventh grade. Um, and that's not true at ninth grade, the students are running the show, they're running the assembly, and you know it, it feels a little different. So you know I do really advance and support the the concept of the phasing, and I also acknowledge that you know some compromise seems reasonable about uh, shortening that to a week and getting the five days a little bit sooner. I don't know how the rest of the committee feels about that, but um, yeah, that that seems you know from my vantage point reasonable and acknowledging that middle school is different and that they've been out of school all year and there's urgency to get them in. I, I would, um, I, I support the compromise. I, as a, as a middle school parent, I, I, I would be hesitating to sort of jump straight in um, to five days a week. I think also forget, um, it's eighth grade families know this, but the eighth grade um, cohort had completely new teams this year. So they're, um, many of them are in, in completely new cohorts or, or sort of very different cohorts than what they had in seventh grade. So in many ways, their eighth grade experience is not sort of a continuation of last year. Um, so I, and so I, I support the compromise of one week. Um, Ms. Seeger. Yeah, I support the compromise as well. Um, in thinking about this, the kids since the beginning of the year we're three quarters of the way almost three quarters of the way through it and they've already had a tremendous amount of growth and they have met some of their classmates online and they have um, met their teachers and i realize that might be shifting I, I can't say i fully understand how it works but um it's it's not the same as fresh new seventh graders coming in i mean this will be the first time that they're in the building but but they've also experienced the teachers and their classes for quite some time now so um, I'm definitely in support of shortening that, that interval and, and a week seems I'm supportive of the compromise. Mr. Danley? Yes, compromise good. Anybody um, who hasn't spoken um, that has a differing perspective on it? We've now gone past uh, 10 o'clock, so I know we're all like fading. Um, and I really appreciate the that all, that uh, leaders from middle school, Summit Academy, and high school have stuck with us uh, as we <laughs> at this very late hour. I know you've you've had very long days, as, as many of us have as well. So uh, really appreciate you staying with us as we hear and ask questions. So I'm hearing um, and, and sensing sort of um, agreement to the desire to ask the middle school to consider a one week phase in, a one week hybrid and move to the full time after one week of that. Is that what I'm hearing? Nodding heads? Okay. And, Thank you, Principal Sharon. Um, and did we want um, to see our uh, high school team is, is back on. Um, are, are we looking for some head nods um, for, for your plan as well? Sure. I think so, yeah. So 
So I know now 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 it's it's late. If we can remember back <laughs> to to that, um, I um, there was questions again about that one about the timing of the ninth grade orientation and the start of all classes. I think we had some questions on that. I don't I don't recall that we had a similar compromise idea on the table on that one. Um, no, and I will say that what works out well with what was just agreed to for the middle school is it means that all of our secondary students go back five days a week on the same date, which is May 3rd. So our operations folks who aren't on this call will be very pleased because they weren't in love with, you know, they want clarity. And so from the bus, from the food, that actually is going to be a very attractive option, you know, if the committee is okay with that. Um, and I think, I think after all three, hopefully understand that there's different levels of complexity um, and, and not one is more complex than other, but there are different levels of complexity between our schools, uh, particularly as the models are really different. One, you know, the, the middle school model is so much more similar to what those of you heard from the elementary schools, whereas the high school model adds that piece of teachers teaching both live and uh, remote students simultaneously and, and all those pieces do add and the, the size of the school. So, you know, the committee is okay. I'd like to advocate that, you know, while there's different front ends of that, that week before that we, we commit to May 3rd, um, all seven through 12 students have the opportunity for five days in person instruction, you know, that I think it, it keeps things tighter on the operation side and that would be greatly appreciated by again, a bunch of folks who will be at work at seven o'clock in the morning tomorrow, figuring all this out in addition to the people on this call, but you know, mostly the people who are not on this call. Ms. Kenny. Uh, sorry. I, uh, um, so the high school had requested a day for ninth grade and new students to come in. So would that be May 3rd or would that happen the week beforehand? Ah, gotcha. Okay, thank you. Any other? Thoughts at um, so folks um, on board with that um, that proposal. So uh, seventh and eighth grade are hybrid for the week of the twenty sixth. Ninth grade and new students enter the high school on Friday, whatever that is on April, um, the last Friday of April, um, and then all students seven through twelve are five days a week beginning Monday, May third. Yes. seeing heads nodding <laughs> okay I think 1005 we'll take it <laughs> sorry what at 1005 we'll take the nodding that's that we love yeah. nodding <laughs> and, I, and I, I don't i don't recall any sort of questions or, or concerns about the plan from summit academy so i think that's a big um he nodding heads for that one as well Okay. Thank you all for bearing with. I know it was a long evening, but we appreciate being able to, you know, present this and gather the feedback as we move forward. So appreciate it. And I want my administrators to get off the call and not hang around any longer because they got to wake up in the morning and be with, you know, staff and kids. So thank you all for staying up very late. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Okay. Um, do we want to just keep going? Okay. Um, so what we added uh, was the uh, statement that um, Ms. Lord brought, mentioned during the um, our announcements, and that she and I worked on drafting. Do you do you want me to share screen, Ms. Lord? Yeah. Okay. To find it. Well, I could if it's easier. I just am not so good at it. I think, oh, no, I have it. Perfect, thanks. Would you like me to read it? Yes, that would be great. Okay, dear, I, this needs to, okay, ARPS families, community, and we mourn alongside our Asian and Asian American community Although the most recent surge of anti-Asian violence is elevated from the pandemic and fomented by some political leaders, anti-Asian violence has a long history deeply woven in this country. We condemn racism and xenophobia against Asian communities. 
Asian and Asian American lives must not be devalued, demeaned, or dehumanized. Solidarity is important and action is critical. We commit to work collectively with the whole school community to dismantle the white supremacist culture and eradicate racist violence. And that is, then it would be signed by us. Mr. Demery. Um, I really like it. It's succinct. It's to the point. It has heart. Um, uh, I think any longer would just sound, I don't know. I, I think it's, I think it's really well, well written. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I would support it, you know, and, and certainly support bringing back, um, the discussion of, um, Asian American, uh, of racism against Asian Americans, uh, in our, in our future discussions of our, of our, uh, curriculum on equity and social justice and, and how that, how that plays into to our, our efforts here. But this is, this is really well written and, um, thank you for, uh, bringing it forward. Um, I move that we accept this statement um, to support our Asian and Asian American community. Second. Moved by Stancer and seconded by Spitzer. Any other, any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, move to a roll call vote. And I can't see, okay, now I can see everybody. Uh, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, the motion passes uh, unanimously. And so I will convert that to a PDF that then we can uh, include on our website and post. Great. And do we have any warrants for uh, the region? Uh, yes, we do. All done to the right. There are four of them. So I wonder, do we want to, could we do the gift while I bring up the warrants? Would that be acceptable? I apologize for. Sure. Um, I will make that motion. I'll move, uh, move that we accept the following gift from Shirley Musumechi, um, number 9342586 to support the Leo Vino scholarship in the amount of $500. Oh, thank you. And from Ryan Mitchell, number 101, to support the Mitchell Family First Generation Scholarship in the amount of $1,000 for a total gift amount of $1,500. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald's and seconded by Stancer. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll um, take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Put my cheat sheet away too quickly. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes 9 0. Thank you. Um, now I've got them all lined up. So I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $629,630.25 for the warrant dated March 10th, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $622,156, revolving fund expenses of 
$436.25 and other funds in the amount of $7,038 for stabilization fund. And this was signed by me on March 10th, 2021. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $226,484.02 for the warrant dated March 15th, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $161,016.44, revolving fund expenses of $15,96, and grant fund expenses of $50,451.62. And this was signed by me on March 15th, 2021. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $4,139 for the warrant dated March 22nd, 2021 for revolving fund expenses in that amount. And this was signed by me on March 22nd, 2021. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $126,838.49 for the warrant dated March 18th, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $101,107.51, revolving fund expenses of $4,481.33, and grant fund expenses of $21,249.65, signed by me on March 19th, 2021. Thank you. Thanks. And I'll now uh, move to adjourn the Regional School Committee. Is there a second? What sorry. about future agenda? Oh, sorry. Future agenda planning. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for my vice chair for helping helping us out. <laughs> future agenda planning. Um, our next meeting is the first Tuesday in April. And I'm just pulling that up. April 6th um, is our next meeting. We have a um, few items there. Um, middle school grade span report and next steps. Um, we will have an update on ELL. Um, we will um, also have an annual report presentation from the SETF. Is that, um, I believe that, that was the date that we, we planned. Um, and then we'll also have an executive session um, on that evening to discuss um, negotiation strategy with the APEA. Any questions as we've, um, the other annual report that we've been um, talking about with the CPAC group um, they've uh, asked to push, be scheduled for our meeting in May. So on May 4th is, is when the CPAC annual presentation is. So SETF on April 6th and CPAC on May 4th. Ms. Dancer. Um, just a question. Um, will there be any new course presentations? I mean, I know this is a crazy year, so maybe there won't be any maybe people aren't thinking that way but i'm just wondering uh we're not planning on having those those would have had to have been um submitted quite a while ago to go into okay. the course registration piece yeah okay great thanks but you're on it because we usually do so thank you for that <laughs> okay anything else from the sorry mr sullivan Yeah, sorry I had to step out and step into the mud. Good thing there's no buses running for the region right now. They wouldn't get through. But so anyway, you mentioned the word field earlier and I and I missed Miss Stewart's presentation. How is our football, softball, baseball field holding up to the football that's going on now that the field is thawing out and turning into mush? So that's would you like to, are you suggesting that we add that to our April 5th, 6th? I did, no, no, I was looking for like a, a three second answer and then I would be quiet. 
Um, since that's not on our agenda and it wasn't in our superintendent's update, maybe you could follow up directly with Dr. Morris afterward. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Um, we were talking about the fields within regard to graduation, though. I think that was that may have been part of that. But anyway, any other agenda questions? Okay. So now I'm afraid to make the motion, but I will move. I will move to adjourn. <laughs> second. Move by McDonald's. Second by Spitzer, and there's no discussion. So, Mr. Dumling. Dumling, I. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, I. Miss Kenny. Kenny, I. Miss Lord. Lord, I. Miss Seeger. Seeger, I. Miss Spitzer. Spitzer, I. Miss Stancer. Dancer, I. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, I. And McDonald, I. We're adjourned. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>